member supply, uh, talks about. My apologies to Mr Lamont. I did my absolute best to get to your question, but unfortunately um, time has caught up with us. The next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown on the Caledonian Sleeper franchise. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Colin Keith Brown, when you're ready, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to Parliament for the opportunity to make a statement on the future of the Caledonian Sleeper franchise. Uh, this morning, I advised Parliament that the procurement process for the Caledonian Sleeper Rail franchise had been completed on time and to plan. The competition has been evaluated rigorously on the basis of the most advantageous balance of quality and price. Uh, and the Scottish Government intends to award the contract to Serco Caledonian Sleepers Limited. The new franchise contract confirms the Scottish Government's commitment to transform this iconic Scottish rail service, which will commence on the 1st of April 2015 and deliver investment in the service for the next 15 years. This contract is good for passengers, it's good for staff and it's good for Scottish business. In short, it's good for Scotland. The contract secures the future of the Caledonian Sleeper, ensuring it delivers a service fit for the 21st century and that it provides, as it has done for over 100 years, a unique, valued and high-profile overnight service between Scotland and London. Before I give some details of the contract, I would wish to say a few words about the context of railway franchising. As members will be aware, franchising is a requirement under the Railways Act 1993, introduced by a previous Conservative administration. That Act precludes any UK public sector organisation from bidding to operate a railway service. However, no such barrier applies to state-backed organisations from Europe or elsewhere, and I believe that's fundamentally unfair and constraining. It's unfair because it discriminates against UK or Scottish interests. And it's constraining because it restricts the range of options available to operate our railway services. As I've stated publicly on many occasions, it's the unfairness of the restriction that I find objectionable as much as the relative merits of the case for private or public franchise operation. I've written to numerous Secretaries of State during my term of office requesting a change in the law, and each request was refused. I am, however, aware that the Labour Party are hinting at moving from their most recent stance and say they would now look at making changes to the law should they win the UK general election next year. And I am pleased, for my part, that the Labour Party is around, coming around finally to my way of thinking, because they did nothing to address the issue in Westminster from 1997 right through to 2010 and were happy to leave us operating patently unfair procedures. We have to follow the franchising rules imposed by Westminster, and we've always stated that we would do so competently. Accordingly, we've set out a prudent programme and process for the franchise procurements. The Caledonian Sleeper and ScotRail franchises managed by a properly resourced and expert team within Transport Scotland. Following a pre-qualification process, we were delighted to have attracted three final and high-quality bids from Arriva, First and Serco. Each of the bidders are well-established and well-respected railway service providers, and there's clear evidence of the strength of our procurement exercise in that result. And each of the bids, I'm advised, was of extremely high quality. Though I should stress, as many members will appreciate, ministers play no part in the evaluation or selection of the winning bidder. That's controlled by the process administered by officials. After a rigorous evaluation exercise, Serco Caledonian Sleeper Limited came out on top. However, it would be remiss if I did not express my thanks to Arriva and First Group for their participation and the confidence that they've shown in the Scottish Government's vision for our rail services. I'd also like to thank First Group and its very hard-working staff for their management of the service since 2005. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the hard work of Bill Reeve and the rail officials at Transport Scotland during this process. It's also appropriate, I think, to acknowledge the contribution of £50 million for the sleeper announced by Danny Alexander as Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Our specification stated that we would place passengers' interests at the heart of the service and the new franchise will deliver on our commitments. The new Caledonian sleeper will transform the whole passenger experience, right from booking tickets to onboard comfort and hospitality, right through to post-travel aftercare. Before boarding, passengers will benefit from a revamped website, allowing them to view information and book tickets, manage their booking, and even pre-order food online. 
A new app will also be available for smartphones, which is recognition of how much more of us are communicating in this particular way. At stations, lounges will be improved and special sleeper interactive information totems will be placed on platforms to provide real-time information to passengers. And on board, the franchise will deliver improvements for all passengers, from backpackers to business travellers, increasing the pleasure of travel and opening the service to new audiences. The Scottish Government's commitment to investment has led to a real success. New trains will be built, designed especially for this service, and developed in consultation with passengers. And the new fleet will be ready and on the tracks in 2018. And key features of this will include, in the seated accommodation, modern, comfortable cradle seats, as well as innovative pod seats that can transform into flat beds. The train will deliver new standard class sleeper berths, and in business berths, there will be ensuite shower and toilet facilities, making it truly a hotel on wheels. Improved security will be built in for all passengers and their luggage, as well as CCTV in all public areas of the train. And Wi-Fi and PowerPoints will also be available to all passengers, facilities that the modern traveller rightly expects. The club car will be at the heart of the new trains, providing a welcoming place to eat, to relax and to socialise with special themed evenings to enhance the travel experience. And post-journey, the guest services team will help passengers with onward connections as well as wider holiday and business planning. The new Caledonian sleeper franchisee, and as I say at this stage it's an intention to award the contract, we have the 10-day Alcatel period, they've been made well aware of the Scottish Government's policy of bearing down on rail fares wherever possible and in ensuring accessibility to the sleeper for all budgets. The Scotland-London rail travel market, in fact the travel market generally, is fiercely competitive. The Caledonian sleeper franchisee has committed to delivering strong growth in passenger numbers and to achieve this it plans to offer a range of competitive and attractive fares and ticket promotions and so widen the interest in the service for all budgets. I have also been careful to act to ensure that the interests of Caledonian sleeper staff are addressed in the new franchise contract. Accordingly, we have engaged with the rail unions to ensure that staffing issues are appropriately covered, and I am grateful to them for their assistance. Tupi, of course, will apply, as will continued inclusion in a fully funded new section of the railway pension scheme for all staff who transfer to the new franchisee. We have also ensured that Caledonian sleeper staff will retain the benefits of the rail staff travel scheme where they currently have those benefits. And I can also confirm that the long-term future of Inverness train maintenance depot is secure. I have also spoken to the Chief Executive of Circle Group and asked for and received specific assurances in relation to the living wage. Staff currently receive in excess of the living wage and will do so in future and that they have no intention of using zero hours contracts. The Scottish Government is investing in growing train service levels in the Highlands. I think the most recent figures across Scotland are nearly 90 million passenger journeys, both through, that's for the whole of Scotland, both through franchising and rail infrastructure enhancements in terms of the investment we're making. Inverness Depot is well located to support that growth, and so we've required that the next ScotRail franchisee must maintain the depot at Inverness for the maintenance of its own trains, which continues the majority of the work there, and for the sleeper carriages, which will continue to receive daily servicing at the depot. And I'm delighted also that 15 apprenticeships will be taken on in the first two years, underlining our commitment to investing in Scotland's future talent. This franchise is good for Scottish business as well. The new Caledonian Sleeper franchisee is partnering with Scottish businesses to deliver the hospitality service to supply excellent Scottish produce and to provide furnishings. And the franchisee has committed to increase its annual hospitality and catering spend with Scottish local small and medium-sized enterprises to 75% by year five, increasing to 90% through the life of the contract. We have great produce in Scotland, presiding officer, and the sleeper will provide yet another opportunity to showcase it to the wider public, with many businesses from Shetland to Stranraer and Stornoway to Stonehaven directly benefiting from contracts to support this service. As I say, this franchise is good for passengers, good for staff, and good for Scottish business. It will be good for Scotland in general. The franchisee will manage the Caledonian sleeper business and the government's substantial investment to deliver better value, obtaining a good return on investment and achieving a financially sustainable operation. Uh, growing passenger numbers will drive growing revenue, so that annual franchise payments will reduce by more than 70% at current price levels over the life of the contract, a saving, I think, around £130 million over the price of the contract. 
Uh, so this is a new beginning for rail travel, night rail travel in Britain, providing, as I've said before, a hotel, an office and a restaurant whilst on the move. Together with the skills of the franchisee and its partnering organisations, our investment will ensure that the Caledonian Sleeper endures, building on its strong heritage and renewed for a great future. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we move on to the next item of business. Members who wish to ask a question uh, could press the request to speak button now. That would be extremely helpful. And can I call on Mark Griffin? Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the, the Minister for advanced notice of, of his statement. The Caledonia Sleeper franchise, as the Minister has said, is unique, valued and high profile, but there are some concerns with the, the franchise award. Uh, we would like to see a not-for-profit real operating model. Um, and indeed, well, the Scottish Government have said that they are also committed to that. It was nowhere to be seen in the First Minister's Big Six demands of the, the Scotland Bill. The next Labour Government are committed to giving the Scottish Parliament the full powers over rail. So can I ask the Minister why the franchise has been offered for 15 years and will there be a break point to allow different models of rail ownership when we have those powers? There have also been concerns raised that train drivers will not be covered by the CHIPI process since they are employed on a subcontract from ScotRail and DB Schenker. CERCO have stated that they intend to employ GB rail freight drivers for the franchise. So can the, the, the Minister give a cast iron guarantee that existing drivers will have a job based in Scotland after this award? Finally, presiding officer, I'm told that the new rolling stock will be procured and manufactured in Spain. Can the Minister tell me if the Caledonian sleeper service will be running with trains built outside of the UK. Minister. Okay. Thank uh, uh, Mark Griffin for his questions. And first of all, to say in relation to the not-for-profit uh, issue, which is the first thing that he raised, we have said, and I've said certainly consistently, that we were uh, more than happy, in fact, eager to see a not-for-profit uh, bid come forward and we'd have considered it on its relative merits as we were obliged to do. However, talking about future powers that might come really hide the point that the Labour Party has had the chance to deal with this and failed to deal with it over the 13 years in government. You've had every chance. You've had two transport bills which went through the Westminster Parliament where you could have changed the ground rules. You didn't. You stuck with franchising. The, the Labour Party supports franchising. The last words of your last Transport Secretary, Lord Adonis, were to talk about the benefits and effectiveness of rail franchising. That's what you've left us with. That's the process you've left us with. We cannot favour one particular franchise over another. We're bound to do this and we've done it competently. In relation to uh, existing drivers, I think I've covered that in my statement. I'm happy if there's more information that Mark Griffin wants to provide, provide him with that. But we've said that Trupe will apply. It's the same guarantee that's been given by previous governments. So existing staff, including drivers, will have that protection of Trupe. And way beyond that, they'll have that protection of the existing terms and conditions. They'll have protection in terms of the rail travel benefits which they currently have. They'll have a new pension scheme established with the support of the Scottish Government to cover their pension requirements. Perhaps the most fundamental concern that the staff had. And also, I mentioned the increased training opportunities and apprenticeship opportunities. That, to me, represents a very good deal for employees on this service. We have been very careful to make sure that we uh, protect the interests of employees, and I think that demonstrates that we have done that. And on the last question, which was raised by Mark Griffin, of course, the uh, idea of... Um, new rolling stock, of course it's down to whoever wins that bid as to where they place that contract. We have no legal ability. I go back to the legislation which the Labour government supported uh, during its 13 years. We have no ability to prescribe that that should be built in a particular place. Uh, so it's down to the discretion of the contractor. But at least he should welcome the fact that over £100 million will be spent on new railway rolling stock. What did you do when you were in government? Nothing like that. This is a good deal for business in Scotland and a good deal for the staff in the new franchise. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement and can I take the opportunity to congratulate CERCO on having achieved the success in the franchising process. Can I also extend my commiserations to those who were unsuccessful, particularly First Group, a company based in the northeast of Scotland, who have provided an excellent service over the length of the previous franchise. 
Uh, it is some disappointment uh, to me that the Minister has taken the opportunity to attack this apparently successful franchising process, demonstrating during his statement his long-standing aversion to private enterprise and fair competition, something which I will defend at every opportunity in this chamber. The specific issue I would like to address, though, is the £50 million that were mentioned in the statement that came from the UK Government. Uh, that did not seem to be highlighted in this morning's press announcement, which appeared to claim that the money, Government money was all coming directly from the Scottish Government. I am glad that that £50 million has now been acknowledged. acknowledged. I hope the Minister will take this opportunity to offer me further reassurances, for I have asked after this money many times, uh, that it is being properly looked after in its current temporary home, uh, and more importantly, will he explain how that money will be returned to the franchise and to provide ser the, service, uh, of the sleeper service, uh, and how the £50 million that he promised uh, one month after that announcement of match funding will be included in the financing of this franchise. Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, uh, Al Johnson for his questions? And first of all, to say in relation to the franchise process, I've made very clear a number of times what uh, certainly the Scottish Government thinks of the franchise uh, process and the limitations. It would have been nice to have heard from Alec Johnson some condemnation of the fact that uh, UK and Scottish businesses, which are public sector owned, are precluded, whereas German or French or Dutch businesses publicly owned are not precluded. Perhaps he could have mentioned that. But I would say, just in relation to the franchising itself, at least we have done this efficiently and competently. Look at the mess that the UK government, the government that he supports, made in relation to the West Coast mainline franchise. And perhaps he, he could have mentioned that as well. In relation to the money which has been uh, set aside for uh, rolling stock, I have said already that the likely value of that it will be in excess of £100 million. Now, there is other work that will be done with, uh, in terms of infrastructure in addition to the services. But even that £100 million it shows that the £50 million uh, pledged by the UK Government and the commensurate amount by the Scottish Government, I think our contribution will end up being perhaps £60 million, uh, but th that shows where that money is going. And in terms of the, uh, reinvesting that money in the franchise itself, there are clauses within the contract which allow any excess profits to be taken, half of them to be taken by the Scottish Government, and if they become particularly excessive, we take the whole of the profits to then be reinvested further into that service. So what we've done is to make sure that this contract is constructed in such a way that we have continuous a, a, a step change in terms of improvement in service, first of all, and then continuous improvement thereafter. And I would have thought that would be something welcomed by the Conservative Party. Right, I now go to um, backbench questions to the Minister. I have many people requesting uh, a question. Uh, can I remind uh, members there should be one question, it should be brief. And Minister, if we could have a brief answer, in that we will make progress. Maureen Watt, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister uh, tell the Chamber how small and medium-sized enterprises can benefit from this new franchise, perhaps more than they've done in the past? Minister. Hey. Yes, I can. I mentioned during my uh, initial speech about the uh, increasing percentage of Scottish SMEs, which will benefit 75% by year 5 and 90% by, uh, by year 15. But I also mentioned the food hub in Cumbernauld, which will be used to facilitate the selection and provisions of Scottish products. Glencraft in Aberdeenshire will be used to supply mattresses. Laundry services uh, also provided from Scottish businesses. And Shetland will to be used uh, for blankets. And, of course, the Inverlochy uh, Management Group will be helping provide uh, the food, which, with the help of Albert Rue should be of a, a world, sta uh, world standard. Lewis MacDonald, followed by Alice McInnes. Given that the Minister rightly paid tribute to First Group and its staff who deliver the current service, and given that any direct rail service between the north of Scotland and London has to compete with aviation, can he guarantee today that there will be no reduction in quality, comfort, reliability or frequency under the new contract? And in particular, can he tell us whether the new contract will enable a direct nightly rail service between Aberdeen and London seven nights a week instead of six. Minister. 
Of course, we have the ability, and the franchise holder has the ability to look at extending the services. That's written into the contract. And I would say, if you think back to the real 2014 consultation, the uh, scare stories about the sleeper uh, service going all together have, I think, been proven to be pretty unfounded. Uh, I should also say that uh, I can give the assurance which Lewis MacDonald seeks in relation to quality of service. I think I've tried to lay out the ways in which that can happen. It's bound to be improved, not least by the investment in the new rolling stock of that will take till 2018 to come on board. But all the other services, in terms of the customer facing Facing services should happen as soon as the franchise holder takes over. So there will be that increase in quality of service. As to extending the service, that's a dialogue between ourselves, uh, the public and the franchise holder. Alice McInnes, followed by Jamidi. Very much. I'm pleased, firstly, that the Minister has explained how he hopes to avoid the mistakes of previous franchising, not least his predecessor Stuart Stevenson's mishandling of the 2008 extension. Now, it's worth recollecting that in November 2011, the Scottish Government didn't understand the value of this sleeper. You proposed terminating all cross-border services day and night at Edinburgh, and it took vigorous campaigning by Liberal Democrats, ambitious for the North East and the Highlands, and action from Danny Alexander in the Treasury to keep Scotland connected. So I'm grateful that the Scottish Government belatedly recognises the value but of the service. Can we get a question, Ms McInnes? The Minister has acknowledged the £50 million investment from the Treasury. Doesn't this show the importance of strong Scottish voices in the UK Cabinet, able to deliver investment in cross-border services? Minister. Well, I should say, first of all, that strong Scottish voices, uh, uh, voices in the Cabinet may be <laughs> vices too, perhaps, uh, maybe in short supply after the next election, if Lord Oakshot's poll is to be believed. But can I say that... Uh, Alison McInnes is just making it up when she says that we propose to abolish the sleeper. She's just making this kind of uh, stuff up, and it's completely wrong. And I think it's demonstrated by the fact that what we've got now is a sleeper service about to have a huge amount of investment placed into it, a qualitative jump in the quality from the time when her party was uh, uh, running this franchise in the past. And perhaps she's a wee bit scunnered about the fact that we've done something which she never managed, her party never managed to do, and perhaps why they have, we have this sour note coming from the Liberal Democrats. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, what we've been key in trying to do is make sure the process was run properly, which she and her colleagues in the Westminster government failed to do in the West Coast mainline, and also making sure that we keep focused on what the passengers' needs is. And that's why this contract will be good for passengers, but good for staff and good for Scottish business as well. Jimmy Day, followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for ensuring that the interests of staff will be fully addressed in the new franchise contract. But what further assurances can the Scottish Government provide that in realising its ambition for the Caledonian sleeper to become truly world class, that this will at all times be reflected in the terms and conditions of the staff on whom its future success depends? Minister. Well, very briefly, in addition to what I've already said, I should say that I'll be speaking to Tim O'Toole uh, this afternoon in relation to the efforts of First Group staff over the previous term of the franchise and to thank them for uh, the efforts they've made and will continue to make when they transfer to the new uh, franchise holder. But during mobilisation of that period and beyond, we will ensure that paying conditions are protected. Chupi will help us do that. The railway pension scheme I've mentioned. Ensuring commitment to training and apprenticeships is contractualised as well and a personal guarantee on living wage and the uh, use of uh, zero hours contract. I think that looks after to a great extent the interests of staff. Dave Thompson followed by James Kelly. Well I'm absolutely delighted that Inverlochy Castle Management International are going to be involved with this uh, franchise and I would like to ask the Minister how he feels that this will benefit uh, local Highland and Scottish businesses and indeed the consumers who will be using the service. Minister. I think if we can put ourselves in the place of somebody coming onto this new service uh, in London, uh, stepping onto the sleeper train, to get uh, confronted with the best of Scottish produce, with a world-renowned chef like Albert Rue and the Inver uh, Inverlochy organisation, which David Thompson has already mentioned, really does start to send a message about what we think of the service and what we want other people to think about it. And of course, with the attractiveness uh, of the onward journey to the Highlands, we think this would be a great selling point for Scotland and have much wider benefits than merely the transportation of people from place a to place B. James Kelly, followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you. Can the Minister confirm the total value of the franchise payments over the 15 years of the contract, as this has been omitted from the Ministerial Statement? And can he also explain why the contract has been uh, awarded for 15 years and there's not been a break put in place, as is the case with the ScotRail franchise, in order that alternative funding uh, models can be explored to keep money within the public purse? Minister. 
Uh, yes, on the first point raised by James Kelly, the value is around about £180 plus million pounds over the 15 years of the contract. And as I say, that equates to around £130 million pound reduction in the subsidy we would have paid if we'd left things as they were. There is the opportunity for a break around year seven, but I think the conditions of that break really are around the fact if uh, financial conditions have changed dramatically. We've seen in the past, and one of the reasons why the West Coast Mainline franchise was such a spectacular failure was the difficulty of trying to predict inflation and other economic factors over that period. So we have built that into the process. But both the uh, franchise, uh, uh, the proposed franchise winner and ourselves have said today, we fully intend to see this contract through 15 years. And the reason for that is it allows the long-term capital investment, which I've mentioned in terms of rolling stock, to take place, which is much more difficult to achieve in a shorter term of franchise. Mike McKenzie, followed by John Finney. Can the Minister provide details of how Circle will be monitored in terms of maintaining quality and of delivering improvements to the service. Minister. Yes, through a number of processes, including financial penalties, uh, which would also come from a break in the contract, of course, as well, as has been evident in other franchises. But the uh, franchisee will also be measured against their execution of the contract. And since many of the contract's key measures, such as performance, will be in the public domain, it's every, uh, it has every incentive to ensure its effectiveness. And just to say that part of the specification of the contract was 50% emphasis on quality, and they'll be kept to that quality commitment that they've made. John Finney, followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you. I thank the Minister for a very positive news he's announced in relation to the depot and the apprenticeships. With regard to the living wage and zero hour contracts, I note that it's a personal rather than a contractual uh, assurance you've got. The unions have already been in touch to express concern about the way that CERCO discharged their industrial relations with regard to the Northern Ferry contract. Will he work with them to ensure a better relationship is uh, maintained uh, under this new franchise? Minister. Of course, I'm happy to give the commitment to ensure we have the best possible relationship with uh, the trade unions uh, and, the, and the franchise holder. And just to say that the commitment I uh, had asked for with the Chief Executive of CERCO was in relation to not just the living wage, because the staff involved currently earn well in excess of the living wage. So CHUPI and the commitments we have protect their existing wages and conditions. And well beyond that, into things like the rail travel, which they currently benefit from as well. The other thing, of course, they're concerned about are the staff training and apprenticeship opportunities and all those have been protected. So we've spoken directly with the franchise, uh, uh, the winner so far, the preferred bidder so far. We've had those conditions uh, or, or those commitments given by them. But in addition to that, we have this written into the contract in terms of TUPE. The pension scheme was a huge issue for the trade unions. And we've gone the extra mile in relation to setting up a new pension scheme so that existing pensions of those employees is also protected. OK, McIntosh, followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And given that uh, until very recently CERCO were actually banned from bidding from any UK government contracts, I think a few eyebrows might have been raised this morning when they heard the news. Can I ask the Minister uh, the assurances that he received uh, from uh, the Chief Executive of, of CERCO, do they also apply to indirectly employed staff or to subcontracted staff uh, with regards to zero-hours contracts, trade union recognition or the living wage? Minister. It, well, can I say, first of all, that perhaps it shouldn't have raised people's eyebrows, especially in the Labour Party, given that the Labour Party in Wales, the government has entered into a substantial contract with CERCO in the last month. Uh, it's also true to say that Glasgow City Council has a contract with CERCO, which is of greater value than the contract that we are about to enter. So perhaps the Labour Party has got some thinking to do about its relationship to CERCO in relation to this. And the other points I would make is we have these guarantees within the contract in terms of TUPE, we've written it in in terms of the pensions, we've written it in terms of the uh, training and so on, and in addition to that, of course, what we've mentioned in relation to the living wage as well. So I think we've done a pretty good job of making sure that the interests of workers are looked after in relation to this. Perhaps it'd be interesting to know whether it's also true in Wales, where the Labour Party deal with CERCO, and in Glasgow as well. Patrick Hart. Thank you. I recently had to intervene for a Glasgow-bound passenger who, along with some 20-odd others, were left spending a long, cold night at Euston Station after a delayed sleeper left without them. Does the Minister agree that it's the coordination and cooperation between network rail staff and the train operating company staff that really needs to improve to prevent situations like that arising? And it's the human touch that's important, however good the smartphone app and the interactive information totem turn out to be. Minister. 
Uh, could I say, first of all, on those last points, these things are important to people, uh, how they can access the bookings, how they can make sure they have the best possible journey. But, of course, he's absolutely right to say performance in terms of trains leaving on time and arriving on time is extremely important. Uh, and to do that, we have to have, as he quite rightly says, the maximum possible cooperation between those that control the track, the network rail, and those that contain, uh, c uh, control the, the trains themselves. We have done a great deal in terms of pushing forward that integration. We are limited by European legislation and how far we can go in relation to that. We are getting more of it in terms of the projects that we undertake, but we will push to continue to make it as seamless as possible for passengers. And also, if you look at some of the recent figures in terms of performance across the Scottish network, not the sleeper network specifically, but the Scottish network, we have made some remarkable advances, and there is a challenge to make sure we continue that into the future. My apologies to John Mason. We move to the next item of business. It's a debate on motion number 10131 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on Scotland's future. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now, and I can give a very few seconds for uh, the front benchers to get themselves organised. Can I also say at the outset of this debate, time is extremely tight this afternoon, so we are going to hold you to your time. I call on Kezia Dugdale to speak to remove the motion. Ms Dugdale, you've got 14 minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. When the white paper was published in November, I was as surprised as the next person to see that childcare was front and centre. Here is a policy area completely devolved, sold as the cornerstone case for independence. The commentariat were quick to link this policy to the polls and a sizeable gender gap between men and women when it comes to support for independence. Whilst we added our voice to the collective cynicism, we did not lose sight of the ambition for a transformation in the provision of childcare. Whatever the result of the vote at 5.30, this chamber will have accepted for the first line in Labour's motion today that the Parliament will resolve to keep childcare at the top of the political agenda. I regard that as no mean feat, President Officer, and I hope we will keep good to that promise, because high-quality, affordable childcare can transform lives. It has a clear economic benefit, there are clear links to closing the educational achievement gap, it's central to gender equality, and it's key to tackling child poverty. It's an issue that lights the fire of the Labour Party because it's at the heart of our pursuit for equality and social justice. Uniting behind one line in a motion is one thing. Uniting behind a long-term vision for childcare in Scotland that carries the support of at least of the two major parties in this chamber is quite another. That's why Labour's motion today calls once again for a cross-party childcare commission to set out a route map for the long term, and I'll return to that later. Firstly, though, President Officer, I wish to spend a considerable amount of my time focusing on the childcare policy as outlined in the White Paper and the various twists and turns it has taken over the past six months. I believe it needs to be on the record of this Parliament, and it's a matter of regret that it's not been here before today. I find some of the spin, the vacuity and the handling of the statistics around this truly shocking. I can't make up my mind whether this is wild incompetence or deliberate deception. Regardless, let me go through each twist and turn, and I do not intend to give way until I've got to the May events, and I will happily accept an intervention and preferably an apology from the Minister at that point. First of all, let's look at the white paper. The case for childcare is set out in three phases. Phase one, 600 hours of childcare to 50% of two-year-olds, delivered within the first budget in an independent Scotland. Phase two, all three and four-year-olds will get 1140 hours a year by the end of the first parliament. Phase three, all children from the age of one to the school age or five are entitled to 1140 hours uh, of childcare. The costs associated with those, according to the Scottish Government, are £100 million for Phase 1, £700 million for Stage 2. That includes no capital costs whatsoever. They haven't published a cost for Stage 3, but SPICE tell us it will cost £1.2 billion. And again, there are no capital costs associated with that phase. When they were asked where that £700 million was to come from, the SNP said it would come from the tax receipts of 100,000 more women going into work. In January, the government released this paper, Childcare and Labour Market Participation, the Economic Analysis. Alex Salmond boasted that he'd published this very important paper so that everybody can read and understand these things. But the footnote on it was very interesting. 
It says, note the analysis below illustrates the impact of a boost in female participation rates rather than a specific policy. The specific policy will have its own unique implications for the economy and budgetary impacts. These are not simulated here. But the footnotes, essentially the government had examined the impact of 100,000 more women in the labour market, but this had no direct or substantiated link with its own childcare policy. On the 6th of March, the IFS rang the alarm bells, stating that there was little evidence that a major expansion of early learning and childcare would lead to tens of thousands of more women getting jobs. On the 11th of March, Tom Gordon from the Herald received confirmation in an FOI response that there was no modelling of its childcare policy. It stated clearly that modelling the impact of women in the workforce, not the impact of improved childcare itself. A separate FOI request sought details of how long the government had given itself to get 100,000 more women into work. One year, five years, ten years. This FOI was refused on public interest grounds. And let me read it out. We recognise that there is some public interest in release as part of open, transparent government and to inform debate. However, there is a stronger public interest in high quality policy making and in the proper considered implementation and development of policies, particularly on such a significant issue as childcare. This means that ministers need a private space within which to obtain the best possible evidence and advice from officials to be able to consider all available options and to debate these rigorously to fully understand their implications. Disclosing this advice and evidence while the childcare policy is still under discussion and development may undermine or constrain the government's ability to develop that policy effectively. Whilst the government were touring the country saying only independents could deliver transformational childcare, officials were in Victoria Quay desperately trying to work out how. <laughs> but it gets worse, presiding officer. On the 2nd of April, SPICE published its paper on early learning and childcare. It revealed what many of us already thought. There aren't enough women. As outlined right at the beginning, the SNP maths was based on 100,000 women with kids under five joining the labour market. Except there are only 64,000 economically active women and only 14,000 of those are actively looking for work. SPICE also added that a rapid increase in women joining the workforce might lead to suppressed wages stating that this could have wider implications for the labour market and on, and on incentives for women to enter the workforce. But there's not just a problem with the number of women looking for work that have kids under the age of five. It's the nature of that work. The government's paper released in January is based on the medium salary of both men and women, £26,000 a year. The reality is that the median salary for women in Scotland is £17,000. That's because so many women work part-time. When Alex Salmond was questioned about this on Politics Scotland, in both January and April, he cast that aside and arrogantly pointed to the employment stats, showing 60,000 more women returning to work in the last year alone. In the January programme, he said, the vast overwhelming majority of these extra jobs are full-time. In April's programme, he said they were mostly full-time jobs. Neither of these statements were true, presiding officer, and in PQs in my name answered by John Swinney, they were demonstrated to not be true. The vast majority of these jobs were in fact part-time on a two-to-one basis. The major boost to female unemployment stats comes from women over 50 returning to work, not young mums. This matters not simply because the First Minister misspoke, but because it fundamentally undermines the maths once again. Part-time workers pay less tax. They tend to do low-paid jobs. What about these jobs, presiding officer? The idea that a young mum, out of work for three years, can walk into a £26,000 job is a nonsense. I want transformational childcare for lone parents in Nidri, in Pilton, in Wester Hills and in Gracemount. It's the lives of these women I want to transform. Alex Salmond wants their votes. But there's another and a final twist, and that came on the 2nd of May. Government revealed again in an FOI to Tom Gordon that there was childcare modelling. It just wouldn't be released. Let me read out what the FOI said. 
While the strategic policy direction has been set out in the white paper, detailed policy design work is continuing. The premature release of this detailed modelling type work could be to the detriment of the full consideration of the entirety of the evidence and the, under, and the options which underpin development of childcare policy. The modelling work forms only one part of a wider evidence base used to continue to develop this policy. Release of this information could therefore lead to a narrowly focused debate, which may not allow for the measured consideration of all evidence on the best way to deliver the policy highlighted in the white paper, and this would not be in the public interest. President Officer, that's yes, Minister, speak, for we scribbled all over the fag packet and we still can't make it add up. <laughs> Forget the public interest, President Officer. It's clearly not in the Minister's interest for this information to be in the public domain. Let's get this absolutely clear. The Government refused to provide full workings to a paper it published in January. A paper it said it was publishing, in Alex Salmon's words, so that everybody can read and understand these things. Publishing some results in January was a pertinent and a good thing. Publishing all of these results in May is premature and a bad thing. President Officer, we understand the government's childcare policy all right. We understand it to be an absolute shambles. But there is a road back. Government could commit to a child commission and stop hijacking the debate on childcare for its own ends. The Labour Party has set up a campaign called Every Step. We've been touring the country asking parents for their first-hand experiences of childcare. We've been talking to them about their experiences of it, and we know that the quality of childcare, the flexibility of childcare, are just as important as the cost. We understand how important workforce issues are to parents, what people who work with their kids in nurseries get paid, what their terms and conditions are, what their qualifications are. We understand that childcare doesn't stop when kids go to school. If anything, it gets worse. The SNP's policy is based only for children who are three and four years old and some two-year-olds. The challenge is much broader than that. Parents want to see wraparound care and they want to see more investment in breakfast clubs, the two things which have faced the biggest brunt of the government's cuts when it comes to local authority budgets. They want to see council services join up, but they want their politicians to join up too. And I note that the Minister's motion today mentions my colleague Malcolm Chisholm and Willie Rennie, but they can hardly boast about cross-party working when so much of the understanding of government's approach has had to be unearthed through PQs and FOIs, many of which have been rejected and avoided along the way. Transformational childcare is something I want to see, and I think about the mums I meet regularly at Rhyme Time in Craig Miller Library. It's their lives that I want to transform. There's no incentive for them to work just now. I don't want to send them into a low-paid, poor job on a zero-hours contract. I want them to go to college first. I want them to get the skills that they missed out in school. And they can't do that because of the cuts these, this government have made to the college budget. A task made all the harder by the fact that there are 93,000 fewer part-time places for women in our colleges than there were in 2007. 93,000 each year for the past seven years. That's nearly a quarter of a million women denied a place in further education. And that's the responsibility of this government. I know MSPs on government benches share the passion to help these women get back into work. They see independence as the answer. And I believe that their proposal is in tatters. We need to get round the table and address this issue together. They shake their heads and say it is in tatters, presiding officer. They couldn't be more removed from reality. Their own government ministers, their own officials are telling them that they do not have the answers, that their policy is still in development, and yet they sit and they laugh. I find that truly shocking. I look forward to the debate this afternoon and I call once again, let's see the politics out of this, let's get round the table and let's work a long-term vision for childcare in Scotland that can all get behind. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Aileen Campbell to speak to a move amendment number 10131.3. Minister, 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. And President Officer, this government has a significant and a positive track record on achievement when it comes to childcare. So I welcome any opportunity to talk about this. And today is absolutely no different. And it's worth reminding ourselves just what those achievements are and have been. We are building on our previous increase in annually funded early learning and childcare provision from 412 and a half hours to 475 hours in 2007, with a further expansion to 600 hours from this August. That represents a 45 
per cent increase in provision in places for three and four year olds since this government came to office and is worth up to £700 per child per year. We are working with local authorities and partner providers to deliver a phased, sustainable expansion of early learning and childcare that supports more children and families while maintaining quality and, for the first time within legislation, improving the flexibility of provision in line with local needs. And we're backing this up with invest investment by committing over a quarter of a billion pounds over the next two years, including three and a half million to strengthen the capacity and skills of staff alongside the yeah. ongoing expert review of the early years workforce. And we've done all those things because it is the right thing to do. Investment in our children's lives in the earliest years is crucial for the future of our country. Childcare enhances all round development and wellbeing in children. Evidence also shows that childcare is particularly beneficial for disadvantaged children and that the benefits persist through primary school, with evidence also suggesting it carries on into secondary school and beyond. We can also see our commitment to children through our world leading early years policies and strategies, yeah. and of course, our groundbreaking early years collaborative. Indeed. So, presiding officer, we promote the measures we do because they advance both our economy and our society. So, because we know what works and how important it is, we continue to be hugely ambitious. But our ambition absolutely needs and absolutely requires independence. In Scotland's future, we outlined our blueprint for achieving universal childcare in Scotland. And Kezia Dugdale outlined it, but I think, you know, because they're so good, these provisions, it requires and necess necessitates further uh, expansion on that. In our first budget, we will commit £100 million to extend 600 hours of childcare to nearly half of Scotland's two-year-olds. And by end of that first parliament, those vulnerable two-year-olds and all three- and four-year-olds will be entitled to 1,140 hours of childcare, which is broadly the same number of hours as provided in primary school. To achieve this, we will invest a further £600 million. And in the long term, we will provide 1,140 hours to all children in Scotland from age one to start in school. And when fully implemented, around 240,000 children and 212,000 families will benefit. The transformational change of our childcare policy would improve care and learning for young children. It would boost economic growth and remove a major barrier to work for many parents, especially women. Indeed, the OECD and the EU have stressed the importance of childcare in removing barriers to female labour market participation. Order, let's see the Minister. Achieving all this will be one of the major gains of independence, and the experts agree with that premise. Professor Sir Donald Mackay, you know, Labour yes. may laugh, but they, if they want to listen and learn, they should yes. listen to what I'm going to say. Sir, Professor Sir Donald Mackay, an economic advisor to previous Secretaries of State for Scotland, said in written evidence to the Ener Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, no financially responsible Scottish Government would dare to implement the childcare proposals under the fixed block grant funding of devolution unless they were prepared yeah. to take an axe to existing programmes. Mm -hmm. And Bronwyn Cohen, the former Chief Executive of Children in Sco Scotland, noted the difficulties in transforming childcare without independence because of split responsibilities yeah. and yeah. policies. Moreover, our plans for childcare have been widely welcomed with experts recognising the potential our proposals have for improving the lives of children and families right across Scotland. And I want to quote Jackie Brock, the, chief, the current Chief Executive of Children in Scotland, who said, the white paper proposals by the Scottish Government are really exciting. We call them a game changer. So it's a, dis a real pity, despite the enthusiasm over our ambitions for childcare, that Labour persist with this negativity. And the point of negativity, perhaps I'll let Neil Bibby come in. Uh, yeah. Mr hey. Bibby. Negative, um, Neil you've talked a lot about the childcare policies in the white paper. Can you tell us what the total cost of the policy is, and can you tell us how you're going to pay for it? Minister. Exactly. I'm independent. The Cabinet Secretary, I'm always listening to the Cabinet Secretary, and independence is the answer. And we've outlined our first, our first phases of childcare. We're proud to stand by. 
And I'm going to speak some more about uh, the costings and some of the uh, attacks that the Labour Party have put on to our childcare proposals. So perhaps if they want to calm down and listen, they'll maybe learn some more. So, presiding oh, officer, given the progress Mr. we Bibby, have made... will you stop shouting at the minister across the chamber? Minister. So, uh, given the progress we have made on childcare and our ambitions to do even more, we will absolutely reject Ms Dugdale's motion this e evening. But let there be no doubt that our childcare plans would boost female participation rates and the economy. The European Commission, the OECD and various experts all agree on that. A European Commission report from 2009 based on a study of 30 countries concluded empirical studies of the relationship between childcare costs and labour force participation are consistent with this prediction. When costs go down, labour force participation goes up, especially among mothers. The SPICE briefing, which was published on the 3rd of April, states on page 25 there are currently 64,000 economically inactive women in Scotland with children aged 1 to 5. The second and third of the Scottish Government's model scenarios require 68 and 104 inactive women to enter the workforce. However, the very next sentence on page 26 states, in order to achieve the modelled scenarios, the policy would need to influence the labour market decisions of a larger group of women, which could include women who do not currently have children or have children under aged under one or over five years, and future groups of women either before or when they have children, which could extend the timescales of the impact. So in other words, SPICE recognise that the policy operates over more than one year, and women who re-enter the labour market as a result of free childcare stay in the labour market even when their children get older. Without the help we propose, too many never come back into the labour market. And the point is made in the Scott government analysis which was published on the 12th of January, which noted that such an expansion is modelled to take place over a number of years. However, the impact of such a policy on output and taxation will build over time. And SPICE, of course, recognised that every year around 55,000 children are born in Scotland. Their mothers will benefit year on year. Now, I want to turn to the points raised by Kezia Dugdale this morning in her press release about our proposals. For her and her party's information, I want to point to the robust evidence an analysis on which our childcare policy is premised, grown up in Scotland, and an international review of early learning and childcare policy delivery and funding. In addition, our policy takes account of the OECD's Start and Strong work, which highlights the best type of childcare system, and the effective provision of preschool, primary and secondary education study. In contrast, let's take a look at Labour's recent performance on childcare. At the start of this year, Kezia Dugdale and her leader, who's in the uh, chamber this uh, morning, commenting, commenting on what, or this afternoon on what their spending preferences would be for the consequentials, said they would invest in childcare helping 10,000 vulnerable children. And despite us pledging to help over 15,000 children from August next year, Labour voted against those proposals. Uh, uh, uh. And on Scotland tonight, on the 7th of January, when challenged to say what she would cut to pay her childcare pledges, she suggested removing funding from small businesses. The very next day, her party, uh, Kezia Dugdale's party colleague, Patricia Ferguson, confirmed on Politics Scotland that Labour would certainly consider that. Yet when John Swinney said Kezia wanted us to increase business rates for companies within Scotland on question time on the 23rd of January, Kezia protested, that's not true, it's not true. <laughs> so Kezia Dugdale is getting quite a reputation for saying one thing in public and another thing in public. Yeah, both things in public and both in today, and Kezia Dugdale in particular, have made a big play of SPICE's commentary on our proposal. So we have two. We too have asked SPICE to analyse Labour's proposals for 25 ah, hours of childcare. And that. given what Ms Dugdale said this morning about not creating policy on the back of a fag packet, you can imagine my surprise and my astonishment to read SPICE's conclusions on Labour's policy proposals. And I quote, Labour Party researchers have indicated that they are still in the process of deciding the policy <laughs> details and funding. Still in the process of deciding Members the details the and the funding. I didn't realise that Kezia Dugdale's fact in the last minute, Ms Dugdale. Of all parties' policies, my goodness. <laughs> yes, and in response exactly. to Labour's calls to work together, I totally subscribe to that. But I say that with a feeling of deja vu, and that I totally subscribe to it when Labour leader Joanne Lamont made that call over a year ago, which fell completely short in any substance. 
Our, future, our children's futures demand that we can put aside differences and embrace the knowledge and expertise <laughs> that can be found on these benches and beyond the party boundaries. As you draw to a close, please. And in response to Labour's calls today, and in echoing what I said one year ago, that is exactly why I work alongside Malcolm Chisholm and Willie Rennie on our task force, recognising that despite the differences, we can put aside policy, political differences and work towards the best interests of our children. And furthermore, I think we uh, should no, also no, welcome no the cross-party approach a close. to the childcare in Scotland. So, President Officer, we will work with others who want to. It's with regret, though, that Labour's continual negativity shows that they do not have the interest that we have in putting Thanks children's much. lives first That's in fine. Scotland. Thank you. Now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 10131.1. Mr Rennie, you have six minutes, no more. Please. Uh, thank you. Deputy President Officer, and before I forget, I move the amendment uh, in my name. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to discuss childcare in Scotland once again. Members across the Chamber will know the Liberal Democrats' ambition on nursery education. And thanks to our pressure and that of many others in this Chamber, thousands of two-year-old children will get 15 hours of nursery education each week from the 1st of August. That is alongside the expansion in childcare for three- and four-year-olds to match the provision in England. The SNP said that such a provision would not be possible without the powers of independence, but yet it is being delivered under devolution. But I participate today in this debate with a certain degree of sadness and sorrow. Let me be clear that the ambition on childcare in the White Paper is admirable. I doubt there will be any disagreement in the Chamber that we support such an ambition. All people, I think, in this Chamber would support that aspiration, that ability to give children a great start in life. But we know, we know simply that the sums don't add up. It's fine to have aspirations, but the sums do need to add up. And I have to say, the Minister needs a better answer than on the, on, when she was asked by Kezia Dugdale as to whether this could be afforded. The answer that because the Cabinet Secretary told her so is simply not enough. We need something much more substantial than that. £700 million is what the Scottish Government says it will cost to implement Stage 1 and Stage 2 of their childcare plan. That is providing, by the end of the first Parliament, 1,140 hours of childcare a year to all three- and four-year-olds and vulnerable two-year-olds, 48 per cent of two-year-olds. Underpinning the whole policy is the argument that an increase in female participation in the workforce would see a significant increase in both direct and indirect tax receipts. The Government's weak analysis suggests that increasing the female labour market participation rate by six percentage points to Scandinavian levels could benefit Scotland's economy by £2.2 .2 billion and increase tax by £700 million. But there is no detail on the estimates of the component tax revenue streams that contribute to the £700 million. No. Now I know the Minister will say that there is one illustrative example but that is not sufficient. We cannot trust the government on the analysis because they will not release the workings. We don't have the full picture. I've tabled numerous parliamentary questions asking for further information on costings of the plan set out in the White Paper, but not one of those have provided any additional detail. The Council of Economic Advisers, I'm told, has considered the economic and social importance of improving childcare provision. But there will be no full report on its findings. Instead, the analysis informing the Council's deliberations will be reflected in the annual Chair's report. I look forward to seeing whether there is further detail available in that. And it's not just tax receipts which don't add up either. Thanks to the research carried out by SPICE, which we've heard about today, I'm not going to take an intervention. We know that a 6% rise in the female workforce is equivalent to around 104,000 women moving into work. But in 2011, there were only 15,000 women of working age with children aged 1 to 5 who said they were looking for work. 64,000 were inactive 
with the majority of those citing looking after a family as being the reason for not working. Only 14,000 of those said that they would like to work. Put simply, there are not enough women of working age with children to fulfil the SNP's childcare plan. The fact is that the, SM, the SNP and the Scottish Government could act now to improve childcare we offer in Scotland. Thanks to the UK's budget and the improving economic conditions, the Scottish Government now has the money, now it's got it this very minute, to implement the same childcare package as England in full now. That would mean 40% of two-year-olds receiving free nursery education from this autumn, not the figure that we currently have. I welcome the figure, but we're not even matching what England are doing. I agree with some of the government's amendment, especially the importance of cross-party work on the issue and of the value of the Partnership Commission for Childcare Reform as part of the Children in Scotland's Childcare Alliance. But the SNP have played fast and loose on nursery education for too long. First they held back on action to offer a carrot for independence, and now they exaggerate the numbers to make the case for independence. I understand, genuinely understand their passion for independence, but they must not allow it to emasculate this important area of public policy. The future of our children is more important than their passion for independence. I'm pleased that the Labour Party motion acknowledges the continuing importance of this issue and we will support their motion today. Education can never be taken away, no matter what happens to a person. A solid education gives them skills to fall back on and a pride in their achievements, which can't be taken away. Education stands alone in that enduring legacy close, of opportunity. Please. And we should do everything we can to make sure that every child in Scotland benefits from it. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon. Up to six minutes. We're very tight for time today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I did actually think it was uh, rich for the Minister to tell the Labour Party to listen and learn uh, when today they're actually debating their white paper flagship policy uh, with a huge absence in the ranks uh, of the SNP. Um, but I am glad that the Labour Party has selected childcare for debate this afternoon. It is your flagship policy, Mr Russell. Uh, all parties in the Chamber recognise we have to go further, both in terms of the hours provided and in terms of extending uh, eligibility. Uh, and, uh, for example, the issue of birthday discrimination, which my colleague Liz Smith will come back to in her contribution this afternoon. Uh, quite recently, on the Education Committee, we discussed, uh, conducted hearings on Scotland's educational and cultural future relating to the government's white paper. And during the final evidence session, we discussed childcare, and rightly so, uh, with the Cabinet Secretary. Mr Russell gave a typically modest performance, which included the following statement. It's wrong to try and deconstruct it, meaning the white paper childcare policy, and undermine it by taking a figure from here and a figure from there and saying you haven't worked it out. I did think this was quite an extraordinary statement. First to question the financial assumptions behind the policy is not an exercise of deconstruction, it's an exercise of parliamentary scrutiny. And as the Labour motion makes clear, the Scottish Parliament's own information centre uh, recently published a full and a rather devastating brief on the white paper plans. So are Spice guilty of deconstruction too? And perhaps I could go a step further and ask, is freedom of speech no longer accepted by this uh, government? And secondly, there are very good reasons to conclude that as far as this policy is concerned, the Scottish Government has not got its sums right. Notwithstanding the fact that the projected 6% rise in female employment is purely illustrative, uh, as the journalist Tom Gordon and many others have pointed out, uh, and is in no way related to the specific proposals outlined in the White Paper. Uh, others have mentioned today for female employment to reach Swedish levels, 104,000 presently inactive mothers would have to enter the workforce. And as SPICE have concluded, there are 64,000 women in the category and only 14,000 indicated they would enter employment. So the economic modelling for this policy cannot have taken place 
Otherwise, we would not be here today debating this issue and asking for information. But it is a crucial point because, as the Cabinet Secretary said to the committee, the childcare policy, particularly the third phase of the plan, will be funded via taxation. But if there are not enough women able or indeed willing to enter the workforce, this raises questions about the proposal's affordability. Spice have estimated the third phase uh, would cost 1.2 million, could rise to 1.5 billion, uh, I should say, if costs continue to grow. And to generate this kind of figure from increased workforce taxation alone, it's estimated we would need to see a 10% rise in employment rates, which is extremely sub substantial advance in what would be a relatively short time frame. A further point relates to the nature of work uh, these mothers are anticipated to be doing. I think Kezia Dugdale raised this point. But in a press release issued the day after the White Paper was published, the Scottish Government indicated that the projected 35,000 additional childcare jobs will be, and I quote, mainly for women. But we all know, and in my case, from my family's experience, those who work in the nursery sector are low paid, mainly on a minimum wage and many on zero hours contract. And I think at this point, uh, I would like to add that they are bit much more highly trained and qualified than they were a decade ago. They are all uh, registered with the Scottish Social Services Council. And I think in a debate such as today, we should all put on the record how much we value everyone who works in childcare. And can I say, it's not just about education. The great thing about childcare is identifying any development needs a child has at the earliest stage so that these can be corrected pre-school rather than post-school. But I very much welcome Professor Siraj's review of the early years workforce. Uh, unless conditions are radically altered, then many part-time workers within the sector will not earn enough to go beyond the personal allowance. Uh, since the coalition government came to power, that has increased year on year and is now over £10,000. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, the increase in the personal allowance has taken over 200,000 of the lowest earners in Scotland out of income tax altogether. Uh, moreover, it's assumed that the earning potential of these presently economic inactive mothers will be roughly equivalent to those in work. I'm running out of time, so, but I would just say it's not solely the absence of childcare that's holding women back. It's also better access that's needed to education. I'm almost finished. Um, uh, and I, just finally, presiding officer, we know the Scottish Government has not directly modelled the impact of improved childcare. Uh, there is public interest in doing so, and I hope that the Information Commissioner will do what she did in terms of the legal advice uh, for Scotland entering the European Union and take this uh, Government to close. the High Court in order to you get this information close. if necessary. Thanks very much. Now call on, we now move to open debate. Call on George Adam to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Less would be more. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you for that subtle hint there as well. I'm always happy to talk about childcare, President Officer, in the Chamber. We've talked about it quite a lot, and I can see the transformational change it can make to constituencies like my own uh, when we, with, if we look at the Scottish Government's plan. But perhaps I'm even more focused at the moment, and I should possibly declare an interest at this stage, because since we actually started talking about childcare, my daughter Jessica and her partner John are now expecting their first baby. So I will probably be looking at this with a lot more uh, kind of detail because uh, they are obviously going to be dealing with that in the future as well. But that focuses me from the point of view is what future do I want for my grandchild? We're sitting at a stage here where we've got two futures again and what kind of country do I want my grandchild to grow up in? And we do want Scotland to be the best country to grow up in. And I think that independence is the only way that we're going to give that opportunity to children and families like our, my own in order to make the difference that that transformational change to our nation's future 
The Scottish Government's policy in childcare and independent Scotland can and will make that type of uh, difference. Now, this is also backed by a lot of the experts, like uh, already mentioned by the Minister, Jackie Brock, the Chief Executive of Children Scotland, stated that this demonstrates an undeniable that the quality early education and care has advantages for every child, but is especially important as one measures to eliminate Scotland's inequalities in educational attainment. Now, I believe that the quality childcare, this will make a difference from the point of view as I look at it from my own constituency. Uh, we have difficulties like other constituencies have. I have said often in this chamber that I, I do not doubt for a moment anyone's passions, anyone's beliefs and why they uh, got involved in politics to try and change things. But in my area, we have got an area in Fergusley Park where it has just been an area of multiple deprivation for decades. And it's been, I would say, and I've said before, that I believe that constantly tinkering about the edges that the union has done over the decades has not made any difference in places like Fergusley Park. We need the type of transformational change, the independence and the full levers of power that offers us that can make a difference to young people and children and families in areas like that. Because people in my constituency are fed up hearing the same old, tired arguments from the unionists. They're fed up hearing that we can't make a difference, you know, and the same argument goes from one election to the other, Labour, Tory, back and forward. One more push for Labour will make a difference. Never made a difference in the past, won't make a difference in the future. The difference we have to do is we have to just start from the beginning and look at how we can build the type of future. And this offers that opportunity. You know, as I say, the aspirations we have for Scotland is that we can make it the best country for our children to grow up. Let's go down that route. Let's move away from all the petty. You know, panto season almost came early when I was listening to Miss Dugdale earlier on because it was full of cliches and lack of vision. We have to look at how we can actually promote the future for Scotland and move away from the petty bickering that the public quite clearly are just fed up with. And I think we have to kind of look at the debate and do it in a mature way. Way. We have to sit here and look at the issues and say, how are we going to make things better? And just as I said, mature, Mr Bibby get up. So here we go. <laughs> Neil Bibby. We have to look at it in a mature way and, and people want substance and facts. Well, uh, George Adams support our call for the Scottish Government to publish all relevant costings and economic modelling on the childcare policy. George Adam. Adam. Officer, substance and fact. Substance and fact is something that does not go with Mr Bibby in any shape or form. You know, they should start looking at their own policies, which they actually recently announced. I think it was called Together We Can Document, which the Spice paper actually said that the proposals from Labour don't outline the anticipated impact on female participation in the workforce, and so the supporting background information also does not show the likely scale of impact of female participation. So they have a cheek to come here, presiding officer, and lecture us when they have no plans and no ideas for the future. So I will say, you know, I'd make an appeal to everyone in the Labour Party again to be positive, to actually work with us. Let's work together. Let's ensure that we can actually make this difference. Because I don't doubt that there's good-minded people in all the benches round here that want to make that difference. But I'm not seeing it here in the chamber when we debate it. I don't want to sit here for two and a half hours and debate and talk about strategy and ideals and what we're going to do. I want to create the policy enforce the policy and then make a transformational change in Scotland. That's what responsibility of independence is and that's what the difference that our ideals would actually show for Scotland. Now, you know, the aspirations that we have, we have to look at, you know, surely we're a bit better than constantly just going back in this bickering here at this stage. The Scottish Government has printed a white paper in Scotland's future. They've shown the way quite clearly how we can make that forward and promote that. I have still to this minute to hear anything positive or any future if we remain within the union. I plead with the, the unionist parties within here, will they actually show us if they want to remain in the union so much, what is their future for childcare? What will they do for young people and families in Scotland? We've not heard it yet, and, presiding officer, I can guarantee you we won't hear it in the future. So, in closing, presiding officer, I think we have to be aspirational, we have to be bold, we have to support the ideals that the Scottish Government are putting forward, and let's all work together so that we are not standing here in 10 years' time and wondering why we still have problems with child poverty.
Many thanks for your brevity. Now Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Billy Campbell said at the end of our speech that we can work together on this agenda. And of course, this is exactly what is at the heart of Kezia Dugdale's uh, motion today, where she's calling for uh, a childcare commission, which will develop a long-term vision for childcare. And she uses the word consensus. So that is absolutely central to what is being proposed today. There has been a great deal of progress on the early years agenda, particularly with reference to child development. And that's been the particular focus of the early years task force, of which I've been glad to be a member. But obviously there's a wider childcare agenda as well, which is to do with parental employment, gender equality, and childcare as a weapon against poverty. And that is something, of course, that we would like the Commission to take up as well. Now, what I deeply regret in this whole uh, debate about childcare is an area that did have a great deal of cooperation and agreement. Obviously, differences we pushed a lot on more for two-year-olds, and to some extent the government responded to that. But there was a lot of common ground, and that all ended on the day that the white paper paper was published, and I deeply regret that as someone who has had a passionate concern for childcare uh, for over 20 years, because since then we've seen the hijacking of childcare for misleading constitutional uh, uh, debating points and spurious uh, referendum point scoring. Now, of course, it's particularly galling that the First Minister never had any interest in 27 years in Parliament <coughs> on this subject. And that suddenly, when he saw uh, the gender gap in the referendum polling, suddenly childcare was thrust uh, to the fore. And I deeply regret that. Now, there are at least three fundamental problems with what the White Paper is arguing on childcare. As a general proposition, of course it's true, if more people go into work, you get more revenues. And under Labour's proposals for greatly enhanced fiscal devolution, more of that revenue will be kept in Scotland. So there are great incentives there, of course, to increase employment. But of course, it would not work like that in independence, because we know, firstly, we would have to have those upfront costs of 700 million in the first parliament of an independent Scotland, upfront costs. And all the independent experts are saying that the fiscal position in the first few years of an independent Scotland would be more difficult and more bleak than our current fiscal uh, situation. So it's easier to put in the childcare investment now than it would be in 2016 in an independent Scotland. But of course, the fundamental deception, and this has been talked about by several speakers already, is about the uh, employment effects and the revenue effects of what is proposed. And the 12th January paper is particularly deceptive in that regard because it paints a Swedish model, a 6% uh, increase in the labour force, £700 million in revenue. But what the Scottish Government is proposing in the White Paper is not the Swedish model of childcare. The Swedish model is based on achieving full-time employment. There's nothing in the White Paper about after-school care. And even, of course, the under-fives uh, does not allow for uh, full-time uh, employment. And as we know from the Spice paper, even if it was proposing something more like a Swedish model, the numbers simply don't uh, add up, because for that uh, Swedish level of employment, there would be 104,000, this has been much quoted, but it's really the heart of what we're saying, 104,000 additional women with children under five would go into the workforce. There's only 64,000 in that position, and Spice estimates only 14,000 of them want to go into employment, because quite a lot of uh, parents, particularly mothers with children under five, want to delay that. So that is the deception, really, that is at the heart uh, of what we are being presented with in the white paper. We're told suddenly all this would be possible, and I'm actually arguing it's more possible now than it would be in the first term uh, of an independent Scotland. Now, it's not to say, of course, if those policies were implemented, there wouldn't be advantages, of course, child development advantages, advantages for many parents currently working who might be able to have more free care rather than informal care or paid care. So, yes, those policies... I'm sure we would support a lot of what we're proposing is quite uh, similar to that in terms of provision for under fives and so on. But it would not have those dramatic employment effects, which is the heart uh, of, of the argument that the SNP uh, is putting forward as part of their referendum uh, uh, campaign, campaigning. Now, one obvious way to improve what is proposed then would be to build in after-school care. And that's something that we are arguing for now. We are saying that we, we want uh, to have uh, after-school care as central to our child care policies, and it's in our current uh, policy document. That is a big issue to return now to the present. In my constituency now, there are simply 
aren't enough places uh, for after-school care, and that is absolutely fundamental for uh, parental uh, employment. And a particular issue in Edinburgh, of course, is that there isn't actually building capacity for this. I know uh, in North Edinburgh childcare, which I always mention in childcare debates, uh, does a lot of after-school care in school buildings, and now they're under pressure to move out of those buildings because there isn't space in the schools uh, for the expanding role. So big issues about after-school care. Now, let's address them. Another feature that we've highlighted in our policy document is investing in the child care workforce. That's absolutely fundamental. But again, I hear this from North Edinburgh Child Care, who have a brilliant child care academy, which has won awards. They have particular problems now because they can't train those 24 and over as they used to because Skill Development Scotland is only putting in the money for those that are under 24. I mean, it's worthwhile doing that, but not to the exclusion of the older people. So let's address these problems that we face now, finally, in the last few seconds, affordability. Clearly, we regret the UK you government close, reducing please. the child care tax credit element to 70%, but there are still possibilities for subsidy from the Scottish Government now. Again, North Edinburgh Child Care has benefited for that, and Save the Children are suggesting for children in deprived areas, let's put money there now to help uh, the anti-poverty effect of child care, which is there among all the other advantages. Thanks very much. Now, Colin, Joan McAlpine to be followed by Jane Baxter, up to six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Listening to some of the Labour contributions, I found myself thrown back to my university days, so a long while back when I studied social history and Labour history. And I couldn't help thinking about the founding fathers of the Labour Party and how they would have approached this. Um, they were inspired by a vision and they set about realising that vision. And today, Labour are crippled with an obsession with process and point scoring. And I'm just so glad that Kezia Dugdale wasn't around to tell Tom Johnson that he couldn't electrify the Highlands because he hadn't modelled it properly, or John Wheatley couldn't build social housing because he hadn't got the numbers right, or Nye Bevan couldn't start the NHS because he had to prove how it would pay for itself. Yes, I will. When if she recognises that neither Tom Johnson nor Nye Bevan misled the Scottish people on the cost of electrification yeah. nor the costs of the welfare state. John McAlpine. I think, I think the word mis misleading is... Uh, I hope he will withdraw that, because I think that was extremely uh, inappropriate and I think we can do... I would like... It's a pity I we think can't we call can do these without people. The word it's a pity we can't in call future, these Labour founding fathers to see what they would have made about this lack of ambition in the present-day Scottish Labour Party. But who we have heard from are people like Dr Jim McCormick, who's an advisor to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who was giving evidence last month to committee... And I asked if a transformative approach to early years, uh, if he agreed with me that that was the single most significant thing we can do to a clo close the attainment gap that currently sets in before the age of five and widens as a child grows up. And Dr McCormick agreed with that and he said he looked at both yes and no and the challenges of yes and no outcomes in the referendum and he said if there was a no vote there would need to be substantial devolution of tax credit powers so that we had the revenue that would allow us to make up from, for some of the income tax that we didn't have. Now we know from Labour's devolution commission that uh, not only is a, uh, income tax, only a tiny proportion of income tax is, is being devolved, but there's certainly no plan to devolve uh, tax credits or any other um, form of welfare. Dr McCormick went on to consider the situation after a yes vote, and he said the fact that transforming childcare has been the number one social policy issue of the year so far must bode well for the kind of political space we might find our ourselves in. Now, I was particularly interested in Dr James McCormick's remarks because I'm old enough to remember him in a past life um, when he, back in 1996, authored with one Wendy Alexander an, institute, uh, uh, an article in the Institute of Public Policy Research called The State and the Nations. And this article is widely considered to be the first uh, draft of the Scotland Act. And, of course, Miss Alexander went on to work for Donald Dewar and... and uh, 
and, and, and to help him draft that Scotland Act. And Mr McCormick and Miss Alexander, they were the bright young things of their day. And in their day, back in the 1990s, they did have ambition for the people of Scotland. But you look at the bright young things like Kezia Dugdale on the front bench and compare them to those, those people back then and just think they don't seem to have made a great deal of progress. M Mr uh, McCormick seems to have got more radical as he's got older and he showed himself to have moved with the times, whereas Labour seemed to be stuck back in the 1990s, unable to radically develop devolution in any meaningful way. But it's not just Mr McCormick who's grasped the opportunity of transformative, uh, the transformative nature of a Nordic-style childcare system. Back in 2012, none other than Ed Miliband had his Borgen moment. And in a speech to the Sutton Trust, he said... If you are born poor in a more equal society like Finland, Norway or Denmark, then you have a better chance of moving into a good job than if you are born in the USA. And if you want the American dream, move to Finland. Yeah, when I sit in both the Education Committee and the Economy Committee, when we've been looking at this particular subject post-independence, all I hear is how it's not affordable, how you can do it. They, they missed both um, Mr Bibby in particular in, in committee has been, has been telling us that we, we shouldn't aspire to Nordic levels of childcare because it's unaffordable. Um, and I would contrast that with the comments of Jackie Brock from Children in Scotland, who was asked in the Education Committee, no thank you, I'm running out of time, um, by Mr Bibby. Um, he was more or less, she was more or less invited to trash the white paper. Um, Jackie Brock said... Greater support from government has been a significant milestone for those of us in the childcare sector. So I would just sort of ask the Labour front bench to perhaps um, take, draw inspiration from the past and from the people who had vision and set about realising their vision and didn't get bogged down with point scoring. Kezia Dugdale has said that her party has not lost its ambition with regards to childcare, but by constantly attacking the ambitious proposals in the white paper, um, she, she just exposes that as a lot of nonsense. She talked about the need for a route map and coming together. Well, we do have a route map. This is the route map. This is our vision for the future, and this is the vision that we are going to realise. You have no route map. You have no ideas and you have no vision. Thanks very much. And now Colin Jean Baxter to be followed by Jimmy Hepburn. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in today's debate as it gives me the opportunity to return once more to something which underpins the well-being and potential of children across Scotland, the issues of early learning and childcare. For this is an issue which doesn't go away and the issue will only become more acute with the Institute of Financial Services predicting a significant rise in child poverty in Scotland by 2020. The issue has also not gone away for those parents and carers who on a daily basis have to juggle the challenges, responsibilities and commitments of family life, part of which is to ensure they have access to good quality, reliable childcare. And until that is delivered, it cannot go away as an issue for all of us in this chamber. As anyone who has brought up children will know, when you're looking at options for childcare, it's not just the cost which matters. Families have to build their childcare around their own working patterns and the availability of nurseries, childminders or daycare in their local area. Crucially, and something that has been missed in current debates, is that we must also consider wraparound care for school-aged children. And if you have more than one child, there can be further complications with getting them where they need to be, and that all adds time to the working day. A nursery or childcare provider whose hours don't match the requirements of the main carers, whether through working patterns or other reasons, will be of no use at all, no matter how high quality or affordable is the provision. And I know from listening to parents that childcare options sometimes have to be decided around what's available, be that friends, family, voluntary, private or public sector provision, rather than what is perhaps best suited to the child or family circumstances. If you ask any parent or carer who's in employment, there'll be a long list of childcare options which are turned to, depending on the circumstances. The childminders who take the children to and from school or nursery, or the daycare centre, or combinations of all of those. Or speaking from experience, the emergency phone call to granny to step in when other options are exhausted. Flexibility and true quality childcare can tackle significant inequalities in development and at the same time support working parents. And for many families, the list of options may be limited due to financial or other circumstances, which is why it's so vital that the childcare provision of Scotland in the future is affordable and flexible to meet the needs of all parents and carers. 
As we all know, it's over three months since the Children and Young People's Bill was passed by the Scottish Parliament. It's a bill which offers some real positives for young people, and yet, as other colleagues have already pointed out, it remains a bill about which some very large financial question marks loom. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of opposition parties, of the Finance Committee and external bodies in the third sector, there do remain a number of question marks over the cost of the childcare commitments outlined by the Scottish Government. And it's not just in childcare. Whether through the absence of financial modelling data or the lack of update on the revised capital costs in the financial memorandum, which are still being awaited by the committee, that there are other question marks over the financial implications of the Children and Young People Bill. I have raised before my concerns about the delay in publication of the Financial Review of Kinship Care. The Scottish Government have promised to publish the findings of the Kinship Care Financial Review by the end of 2013. This was crucial to offer some security to kinship carers who provide a vital role in caring for our children and yet we are still awaiting for the publication of that review. I hope we can hear some indication from the Scottish Government of when the financial review will be published. For kinship carers play an essential part in providing love, care and security for so many of Scotland's children. And we need to make sure we are not forgetting the need to make security's vital foundations before building on the basic blocks of family life with other early learning and childcare opportunities. What is also clear is that the quality of childcare is of fundamental importance. The new definition of early learning and childcare as set out in the Bill is to be welcomed as it recognises the crucial educational aspects of looking after children. I have previously raised the issue of opportunities for all children and the impact a good quality start can have on their life chances in other debates. This point is all the more stark today as we hear from Save the Children that one quarter of all children live in families in relative poverty. Three quarters of these children are under 11. Those children are at greater risk of poverty than any other section of society, and that's damning. And whilst there's no silver bullet, we must come together to ensure that quality, flexible, affordable childcare offers children a route away from their persistently poor situations. Then, as now, it's absolutely vital to remember that access to opportunities for too many children and young people is bound up in a tangled web of poverty-related issues, including housing, food and nutrition, access to transport and opportunities of play, all of which impact on their health, their education, their interaction with their peers and their educational attainment. Save the Children have shown that children living in poverty are twice as likely to be born underweight, three times more likely to have poor diets, nearly four times as likely to have access to nutritious food, five times more likely to live in poor quality housing and seven times more likely to live in households in fuel poverty. And the education gap starts to open up long before school even begins. The end result is that children growing up in poverty finish school with significantly lower levels of attainment, limiting their opportunities throughout life. As much as a single change can begin to make a difference, providing flexible and quality childcare is that change. Our long-term vision for childcare in Scotland must also tackle such crucial issues. It's a long-term vision which is in danger of being cynically used as a carrot for those pushing constitutional arguments without the facts and figures to support any proposals. Whatever the outcome of the referendum in September, the need for high-quality childcare will remain. It's an issue which we all know is well within the powers of this Parliament to consider consider now and in the future, and we don't need independence to improve the lives of Scotland's children. Many thanks. Now I call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Representatives. Can I begin by congratulating my friend George Adam on his impending uh, status as uh, a grandparent. Can I also say to uh, Mary Scanlon, if she's uh, going to introduce the SNP uh, for its turn out today, it might have been an idea to uh, have cast a backward glance first, just to check her own uh, party's uh, dismal uh, attendance today. But, however, can I welcome uh, the chance to uh, debate the provision of uh, childcare in Scotland? This is uh, an issue that I care about uh, uh, very deeply, and I believe that's shared across the board. I'm not going to, unlike others, I'm not going to question uh, anyone's motivation uh, for supporting uh, this uh, as an issue. Uh, I'm informed by my own experience as a father of uh, two uh, children. I've spoken of my own good fortune to be able to secure uh, first-rate childcare for them before. I have also previously been able to uh, speak of uh, the work that I have undertaken uh, with Save the Children on these matters. I have previously hosted uh, a number of parents from across uh, the country who have struggled to access uh, childcare. Many were young uh, single parents, young women with aspirations for themselves as well as for uh, their children. So they wanted to go to college, secure those qualifications. Uh, they need to get the work they want uh, to support uh, their family, and too many uh, were unable uh, to do so. So the question is how best to ensure that we provide childcare to those in that position in the future. And I have mentioned Save 
the children. And I think it's appropriate we have uh, this debate today in another way because uh, this is the day that they've released a, a fair start for every child, which is a, a study of the impact of poverty on children uh, who are poor. Uh, I could perhaps also mention in passing that the Child Poverty Action Group uh, reminded us uh, today, earlier today, that the numbers of child, children in poverty are set to increase by 100,000 in Scotland by 2020 uh, as a result of UK government tax and uh, benefit changes. They, they reminded us of that at the uh, Finance Committee earlier today. But I want to quote from uh, A Fair Start for Every uh, Child. It, it says, young children growing up in disadvantaged families are less likely to participate in formal preschool care which is designed to provide children with a high quality early years learning environment where they can learn skills that will keep them in their later school careers. Many families cannot afford to send their children to preschool because of the cost relative uh, to household uh, uh, income. And uh, it goes on to say parents surveyed by one poll for this report repeatedly cited childcare costs as a reason for reducing expenditure and other goods for getting into debt and for reducing uh, the hours they work. It's understandable then, that Save the Children uh, said to me uh, in an email today, investing in additional state subsidised services is critical and also that uh, one of the demands of a fair start for every child is that every family should have access to high quality and affordable uh, childcare. And that's an interesting conclusion as this is exactly what the Scottish Government wants to deliver with the powers of independence. Uh, I know he does not support independence, but I thought it was very welcome that Willie uh, Rennie uh, said he supports uh, the ambition is set out in, uh, uh, for childcare in the white paper. I do uh, too. He felt everyone in the chamber would support uh, this ambition. Well, uh, I am uh, reminded of the exchange with uh, uh, Glenn Campbell that Joanne Lamont had when Glenn Campbell asked her, do you support the idea that John Swinney has of equal access for all to any additional free childcare? Joanne Lamont answered no. So unfortunately, it is not an ambition that is shared across this chamber. But I do I support uh, these uh, proposals because they will help uh, with the burden of costs. Parents in the UK spend around 27% of household income in childcare. In contrast, families in Denmark and Sweden uh, pay 9% and 5% uh, respectively due to higher levels of state investment in childcare. It will help ensure young children get the chance to have the best start in life. It will help boost participation in uh, the workplace. We know uh, that many countries in the OECD uh, Iceland, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Canada, Finland, New Zealand have higher female activity rates than Scotland, although Scotland is uh, in a slightly better position than uh, the UK as a whole. We know that uh, the OECD have said financial support for public and private childcare providers and parents reduce a key barrier to employment participation for many parents with young children. The European Commission has said that empirical studies of the relationship between childcare costs and labour force participation are consistent with this prediction, when costs go down, labour force participation goes up, especially among mothers. And even the spice paper uh, that some are using uh, as having uh, traduced the Scottish Government's policy states that studies find that an increase in subsidised childcare is associated with an increase in mothers' uh, employment. However, we do uh, need uh, independence to achieve this. And Willie Rennie says he understands the passion for independence on the SNP benches. What I think he and many others uh, in this uh, chamber who oppose independence don't understand why we are passionate about independence. We don't believe in independence as an end in itself. We believe in the power of independence to deliver for people in Scotland so we can deliver policies like universal uh, childcare. I'll come to uh, close, uh, uh, presiding uh, officer, because the reason that we need independence is uh, that uh, whilst it's estimated that Increasing receipts from the four main taxes collected in Scotland by 1% and getting people into work and reducing core welfare spending by 1% would boost public finance about £350 million. Even under the powers of the Scotland Act, only around £45 million of this would accrue directly to the Scottish uh, Government. We wouldn't be able to invest that back into childcare. And, uh, I won't uh, provide the whole quote, but I thought the point that Donald Mackay uh, made in terms of no uh, Scottish Government would be able to would dare uh, implement this policy under the limits of devolution was a salient one. I can't understand why uh, Malcolm Chisholm uh, uh, and others in the Labour Party do not understand this. Uh, it is only with independence that we can deliver this policy. Thanks so much. Now I call Christine Graham to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to declare an interest in this debate on a personal level. I have Peppa Pig yogurts in my fridge. 
I know the stories of the tiger who came to tea and how to hide a lion back to front. My TV is set to see BBs, uh, Katie Morag. I am an ad hoc member or a conscript to that group known as Grannies. Notice I am a granny, not we are a grandmother. Uh, and we contribute largely to free childcare. And I thought it's important to put that on record uh, for all the grannies, grandads and great aunts and what not that do this. To the motion, obviously everyone subscri subscribes to putting childcare at the very heart and the very centre of any government's policies. And this Scottish Government has delivered beyond those of the first eight years of this Parliament, Labour and Liberals were in power and money was flowing pretty freely from Westminster. That has not been happening, as we know, for some time now. And everybody in this chamber knows that this government works on a fixed budget. We also know that in every portfolio, through education, through to justice, through to health, about 80% of that budget is fixed. It pays for staff, it pays for transport, it pays for building, it pays for heating costs. So there's a very small sliver at the top that can be reallocated. And that's the rub. Because when Labour asks for additional childcare, you have to ask, where's the money coming from? It's a fair question, because we all know it has to come from somewhere. And Kezia Dugdale said on Scotland Tonight on 7th of January, when she was asked where are the cuts coming from to fund the childcare plan, because we have to have them, because it's not floating about spare. She said, we found the money, we think the money is there. Rona Dougal says, where is it? Kezia Dougal, the SAP don't think it is because they spent it already on small business rates relief. And when later on Stuart Maxwell, my friend in here and colleague for the moment, asked Patricia Ferguson, so you would cut the small business bonus, Patricia Ferguson said we would certainly consider that. So let's be straight talking. If you're going to put extra money into childcare, which we all want, somebody's going to have their budget cut out of that little 20% at the top that can be moved around. And as for releasing women into workplace, Labour's Labour's uh, uh, um, spokesman on childcare has actually said, Lucy Powell, enabling women to go back to work who want to go back to work in the same jobs they were doing before so they don't pay that pay and status penalty for the rest of their careers will increase revenues to the Exchequer significantly. Such over that time, it pays for itself. I haven't got time. Exactly the principle upon which the white paper is operating. And I have to say... I talked about the better times that we had in the first eight years of this Parliament. I don't recognise Willie Rennie's picture of recovery. I'm no accountant, but I can understand that the UK's debt currently is running at £1.27 trillion. I can understand that the debt interest bill remains on course at £1 billion a week this year. And it's growing at £5,000 per second. Now, I don't see a good future ahead if we stay part of the UK with that kind of debt hanging round our necks and cuts en route to Scotland. I can see less childcare, cuts to our health service. That's what lies ahead for us. And then we will look on at figures, because we're always told we try to bamboozle with figures. The most recent figures today telling us, Danny Alexander, that it cost £2.7 billion to set up new government departments immediately disowned and rubbished by the Professor Dunleavy, who says UK Treasury press release on Scotland cost of government badly misrepresents LSE research. The Treasury figures are bizarrely inaccurate. I don't see why the Scottish Government couldn't do this for a very small amount of money. So there's jiggery pokery from the Treasury. There's jiggery pokery from the opposition benches. And you know, when I'm telling my granddaughter these stories, I'm going to add to my list a new storybook, which I think I'll write myself for bedtime reading, and I'm going to call it Better Together's Funny Money Tree. That's a fable, and that's just my working title. Thank you very much. Now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, a bit like Jamie Hepburn, I thought that uh, today's report on poverty from Save the Children could not be more timely 
in emphasising the importance of good quality, affordable and available childcare. Its stark warning on alarming rises in child poverty across Scotland is accompanied by a direct call. In fact, see the children's uh, first recommendation for policymakers to minimise the impact of childcare costs on household budgets. The statistics which accompany the report reveal what most of us as parents will know only too well. The cost of a nursery place for a child over two in Scotland rose by 31 per cent between 2009 and 2014 and by 26 per cent for a child under two in the same period. Yet at the same time that families are struggling to even find suitable childcare, let alone pay for it, there is ever more abundant evidence about the benefits of good quality care for both parents and children. I thought Bernardo's, for example, they're one of the organisation, organisations promoting the importance of attachment. This is an issue I certainly have followed for some time. Scientific ev evidence suggests that the link or the interac interactions or the attachments between very young children and the adults that surround them, and be that parents, carers or nursery staff, these links, these attachment, attachments are of vital importance in supporting the development of those children and can help avoid problems for those individuals later in life. Bernardo's is working on this through its Five to Thrive approach, which focuses on creating a, a common language, a common understanding between parents and childcare staff of how attachment can strengthen the connection with their child. Now, crucial to the success of this approach, as most of the members here, I'm sure, will realise, is that we have well-trained and committed carers who know that their own job is valued. Unfortunately, presiding officer, Unison Scotland recently found that the average salary for a nursery nurse, and that's a, a qualified member of our preschool staff, the, the average salary for a nursery nurse in Scotland is £13,361 a year. That's half the UK average wage. So we have a dilemma where parents are already in a position where they can barely afford childcare, yet we do not begin to pay the staff anything like what would be expected, for example, in an educational environment. Uh, so I was talking to a parent just this week uh, who only half-jokingly uh, says that she uses the only after-school club available to her as a kind of threat to her children. If they don't behave, she'll put them in the after-school care club. Now, I suspect there are quite a few of us as parents who have suffered similar qualms at dropping off our kids at some childcare establishments. <laughs> I'm conscious there's a danger of, uh, in my own contribution indeed, of not distinguish clear distinguishing clearly enough between childcare and preschool education. But on the benefits of the latter in particular, colleagues from the Education Committee from the first and second sessions of this Parliament will recall the evidence we took on the EPI study to give it its full title, The Effective Pro Provision of Preschool Education Longitudinal Study in England. It found that good quality preschool provision whilst not eliminating differences in social backgrounds, reduced the disadvantage that children experience from some social groups and reduced social exclusion in later life. In particular, it found a positive effect on attainment in English and on social and emotional abilities. Children who had attended preschool from an earlier age were generally more intellectually able, intellectually able and more sociable with other children. So in other words, presenting officer, there is no shortage of evidence to support both the need for childcare and preschool education and on the benefits of that childcare. And I believe there's no shortage of political will either. Presenting officer, as several colleagues from the SNP have also pointed out, childcare was one of the earliest substantive debates in this parliament. Labour and the Liberal Democrats agreed through our Making It Work Together programme for government to put childcare firmly on the policy agenda. And it was an agenda supported by all the parties across the chamber. <coughs> In successive elections and programmes from government from both my own party and from the SNP, that commitment to childcare has remained sincere and we have made considerable progress. By 2002, we had introduced a statutory right to free early learning for all three and four year olds. By 2007, we had increased that to 475 hours, worth just under 2,000 <coughs> worth just under 2,000 pounds a year per child to parents across Scotland. And the recent Children and Young People Act pledges to increase this to 600 hours per year. And I hope all of us, I'm sure, hope that we see some progress on the implementation of this soon. There is political will in this Parliament for more, for more action. I believe there could be cross-party support on how we should implement it. And my only regret is that the referendum has eroded that consensus. 
It is of regret that instead of using all the means at our disposal to help families now, the Scottish Government is promising radical solutions only if people vote yes. I regret that instead of working with all parties to find a sustainable way to increase childcare, to improve the quality and flexibility of existing childcare with the powers we have, we've turned into, as we've heard already, one of these, if only we had the powers debates. And, Presiding Officer, what worries me most about the supposedly transformational promises being made by the SNP is that, on all the evidence we have now seen and heard, these promises are based on nothing but assertion and assumption. And I suspect if the Sunday Herald hadn't chosen to take such a firm editorial line, we may have read more of the evidence and the research exposed by, by Tom Gordon. Presenting officer, presenting officer, as a step, as you close, please. As a step towards rebuilding that consensus, can I support the calls we have heard today uh, for the Minister to publish all the economic modelling uh, to be published so we can see how these figures have been reached? The, president, the outcome of the referendum should have little Must or close. no bearing on this agenda. Thank you. Now, call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Alison Johnson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the childcare proposals in the White Paper have the potential to transform the outcome of women in Scotland. But they are much more than a policy outline and should not be seen in isolation. They are part, an integral and important part, but a part of a vision for Scotland. A vision that absolutely embraces the removing of gender segregation from the workplace, valuing the softer caring roles that women, mainly women perform in their society. And the child care proposals must be seen in the context of the White Paper's Fair Work Commission, the White Paper's ambition for greater female participation in boardrooms and, for the first time, addressing the barriers to women sustaining well-paid, career-rich, professional lives, as so um, eloquently outlined in the Royal Society's Tapping All Our Talents. And far from this being new to this government, it's been at the heart of what it, is, what it has been doing in the Parliament. The quality statement for the Scottish Spending Review in 2011 for the 2012 draft budget states, we recognise that equality is an important driver of growth and that inequality detracts from our economic performance and social well-being. We make it clear in our economic strategy the importance of increasing participation in the labour market, removing the structural and long-standing barriers which limit the opportunities and harnessing diversity and the wealth of talent we have available to us as a nation. This is about a new economics one that tra challenges traditional thinking in this country. Presiding officer, I'm not suggesting that we throw the economic baby out with the bathwater, but more that we embrace econo economic theorem that values the work of the person who puts the baby in the bathwater, bath nurtures the baby, who performs the caring roles so valuable to the economic future of our country. The economist who first opened my eyes to this new thinking was Marilyn Waring, who in 1988 published If Women Counted, which challenged the accepted characteristics of GDP calculation that counted the journey to work as economic activity, but what happened in the home as invisible to that process. It's notable that Finland and Denmark internally used the, work, the unpaid work of women, mainly women in their calculation, internal calculations for GDP, and that's maybe why they are so successful in delivering childcare. Marilyn Waring is a great hero of mine, not only because of her uh, economic uh, academic, academic work, but because she was fundamental in bringing about a non-nuclear legislation for New Zealand. If we're not spending money on bombs, we have more money to spend on what is truly important to the people of Scotland, the future of our children. And I mention her today because I know she had a great influence on in Dr Ilsa Mackay, whose academic research and contribution to the economics of Scotland has played such a great contribution in the development of the child care proposals in the White Paper. Indeed, one of her final publications before her untimely sad death was Counting on Marilyn Waring, New Advances in Feminist Economics. And Gulli Sensen, Professor of Istanbul University, said of this work, Counting on Marilyn Waring provides a timely reminder of the politics and economics underpinning what, how and by whom activities and outputs are valued. 
For those concerned with social justice and sustainable futures, this important and powerful book provides an invaluable practical insight into issues that are in need of greater visibility. Professor, we have so, so much to be thankful for the work of Professor Ilsa Mackay, and indeed in her address to the EIS, she say, stated that the current economic crisis is therefore a turning point, a time for reflection, a time for challenging the norm and taking nothing for granted. I think she had the ambitions that were so eloquently um, uh, spoke of, spoken of by Ms. McAlpine when she was talking about the vision and ambition of, of previous leaders in the Labour Party. And Ailsa Mackay also contributed to the great work that's been done by the Jimmy Reid Foundation in looking at the value of universal services, about welfare that is universal and valued by everyone in society and how that can transform the way that we live. In his tribute to Robin McAlpine on the Jimmy Reid Foundation website, he um, talks about Professor Mackay's response to the First Minister when he first asked her if she would contribute to, to the policy that is within the white paper. And her response was, if you're serious about the policy, if you mean it, then I'd be delighted. But you have to mean it. Well, he did mean it. We are serious about this. The white paper is serious about this. And I have to challenge Labour. Are they serious about this? I have my doubts. I have my doubts because Ed Bell Miliband announced his pledge to crack down and zero our contracts in my hometown in Motherwell. Unfortunately for him, North Lanarkshire Council, run by Labour, have 800 workers employed in using these zero hours contracts. And I have to ask Labour if they are serious again, because this week Unison have released a press release that states Unison in North Lanarkshire is stepping up pressure on North Lanarkshire Council in the union's long-running campaign to end their unfair treatment of low-paid women. As you draw to a close. John Mooney says, for an employer purposely change job scores which lowered pay rates and to admit that they have destroyed paperwork is astonishing and Unison demand to know who sanctions such disgusting behaviour. Is Labour serious? Thank you so much. Now call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is one of the many issues in Scotland where we can make real progress if we don't treat it as a political football. Scrutiny of how we're going to pay for it is welcome. Obviously, the finances are important if any government is going to actually deliver on promises. But I welcome the fact this issue is getting the debate time it needs, as it's fair to say it hasn't had the attention it merits until now. But I hope we can see this debate in the round, the care of children rather than child care. Public policy should be able to help parents make sure their children have the best start in life. Increases in the amount of institutional nursery childcare available from local authorities will be welcomed by parents who struggle to afford to pay for additional hours. And we all know childcare costs here are amongst the highest in Europe. There are other types of childcare too. Many of these are playing second fiddle in this debate, but they shouldn't be forgotten. Informal care from friends and family is the most obvious. Sharing responsibility among friends and family is the way we've raised children throughout human history. This type of care has immense value. It's not measured in the economic terms, like the things Claire Adamson mentioned, but it's immensely valuable. Any public policy we promote should welcome and recognise the important role of this informal care. However, many parents, for all sorts of reasons, don't have this network to tap into. So we look outside that circle. And just who, by, and where our children will be looked after is a massively important decision for any parent or carer. Many of us will have visited nurseries and childminders before coming to a decision, though many people experience a limited range of options or no options. Limited availability for certain days, waiting lists, shortages necessitating increases in travel, expense and inconvenience, and making a long day even longer for both parents and children. But it remains the case that it's often easier to secure a nursery place for a younger child than childcare that fits around the school day and makes working life possible for those with school-aged children. Childcare is absolutely essential for those with children who juggle work and family life, and it can be challenging finding the right place or person to provide this. Fees can sometimes be comparable to mortgage payments, 
and beyond consideration, particularly for those with more than one child. And as I've said, they're particularly high in this country. Yet those delivering the care aren't seeing this reflected in their pay packets. And this is surely one of the most important jobs anyone could do. And I agree wholeheartedly with the comments of, of Mary Scanlon and Ken McIntosh. One size doesn't fit all. We need to have various flexible models of childcare that reflect this and that address local challenges. But we need quality assurance too and mutual commitments to standardise excellence across the board. Presiding officer, daycare should be part of a full childhood, not simply somewhere to park children when we're heading to work. It should be delivered by highly qualified, well-paid, valued staff. It should be such a positive offering that it will be taken up even when there's a parent at home. The new Food Standard Agency for Scotland suggests that 15% of Scottish homes don't have cutlery. Quality childcare can introduce children to important life skills. Many children don't eat at the table and aren't introduced to a knife and fork at home. We can look to the Copenhagen House of Food model and make good food habits an important part of a quality education. We can address our children's lack of physical activity from the youngest age by making the outdoors accessible all year round. Make days where children spend wet breaks indoors a thing of the past. Stock nursery in schools with waterproofs and wellies for all children. Our children aren't as fit and as physically literate as they used to be, and we're paying the price. We need to build links with sports governing bodies and introduce our nursery children to gymnastics and athletics, the basis of physical literacy at the earliest opportunity. And childcare needs to be educational, affordable, universal. And if we achieve this transformation, we'll enable those many women who wish to work to achieve their potential and realise their ambitions. As Professor Sarah Carter has noted, if levels of business ownership among women matched that of their male counterparts, we'd see more than 108,000 additional businesses here in Scotland. But as the STUC have advised, many women are choosing economic activity when faced with high childcare costs and lack of appealing choices. This inactivity can impact on career progression and on the value of women's pensions when they reach retirement age. And single parents face particular challenges accessing childcare and making budgets balance. The great majority of single parents are women and while children are young, there's a marked difference in the number of lone parents working and the number of women with partners working. And the overwhelming number of those working in childcare is women. Childcare is one of the biggest gender imbalances among staff and it's important we address this. Norway has set targets along with extra support for male educators, job advertising, and recruitment campaigns. And Sweden too is often quoted in this debate. In Sweden in the 70s, less than 10% of preschoolers could access a publicly funded place. Their parents took to the streets. And we need too to recognise the important role of childminders in this debate. They look after 30,000 children in Scotland and in too many areas that are a preciously rare resource. We need to make sure that we offer the support that will encourage more people to look at childminding as a career. And let's think about where our childcare buildings are located. Large institutions, colleges and universities should offer childcare provision for staff. This parliament should look at such an option. There's a private nursery in a local college, but it's too expensive for the young mums who study there. As you draw that doesn't close, make please. sense. Presiding officer, we cannot achieve this transformation overnight, but we can achieve it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, Colin Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin with a quote from the later prof late Professor Ilza Mackay. Professor Mackay was much respected and admired across the Chamber for her hard work and dedication to improving outcomes for women and disadvantaged groups in Scotland. Writing in the Sunday Herald in December 2013 about her ambitions for the child care plans outlined in a white paper, Professor Mackay said, The highest rates of employment of mothers are in Scandinavia where public investment in childcare is high. If Scotland could replicate this, tens of thousands of more women could, would be in work in Scotland. A higher female employment rate increases economic growth and productivity and has a positive impact on fertility, making it more likely that population growth will be above replacement rate. Additional investment in childcare provision would more than pay for itself in the medium term. Now, Labour talk about the importance of ensuring that childcare remains at the top of the political agenda, regardless of the result of September's referendum. Now, this was a point made by Professor Mackay, and I agree with the sentiment, though I must say that I'm disappointed, although not entirely surprised, that the Labour Party has chosen to attack the Scottish Government's childcare plans. 
If they really believed in a transformational change in childcare, then they would be right behind the Scottish Government's ambitious proposals. Of course, Labour has form on this kind of behaviour. A few months back, we witnessed Labour MSPs teaming up with the Tories to vote against the Scottish Government's proposals for free school meals and improved childcare provision. It appeared then that this was just another example of the Labour Party choosing to oppose for opposition's sake, particularly as the Scottish Government's plans had been welcomed by a wide range of children's charities and the child poverty campaigners. Now, Labour's actions at the time were rightly condemned in the press and in communities across Scotland, and I had hoped that lessons had been learned about the danger of attacking everything proposed by the SNP for the sake of political point scoring. But sadly, I was wrong. Now, I spoke in the childcare debate back in January when I highlighted the work carried out by Professor Edward Mellish of the University of London. Professor Mellish's research has demonstrated the long-term benefits of effective childcare, particularly for children from deprived backgrounds. These findings were reinforced by a recent research paper published by the Scottish Government entitled Childcare and Children's Intellectual Outcomes, which concluded that high-quality nursery education enhances development in children not just in their early years, but also aids attainment in children at all ages. The paper highlights evidence that preschool education enhances all-round development in children and is particularly beneficial to children from disadvantaged backgrounds, helping to improve cognitive development, sociability and concentration. These benefits continue into primary and secondary school, with research demonstrating that pupils aged 15 who attended preschool education tend to outperform those who did not. Although there are significant social benefits from improved childcare for both parents and children, there is also a strong economic case for investment in early years education. In written evidence submitted to the Parliament, Professor Mackay and her colleagues at the Women in Scotland's Economy Research Centre at Glasgow Caledonian University highlighted research showing how important investment in childcare is to stimulated economic growth. Growth in the construction industry is often held up as a barometer of how well the economy is doing. The WISE group at GCU suggests that in economic terms, the development of a high quality uh, childcare sector is just as important as the development of the construction sector, in that, in that one creates physical capital and the other creates human capital. It is argued that a lack of access to adequate affordable childcare is damaging to the economy and society as a whole, as it acts as a barrier to participation in the labour market by parents and in particular mothers, enabling more women to contribute to the economy through better provision of affordable childcare can help to lift families out of poverty and tackle inequality in earnings, an ambition I do hope we share across the Chamber. And the social and economic benefits of improved early years provision are not in doubt. And the question is, how can we ensure that children and families in Scotland gain access to similar opportunities as those enjoyed by our Scandinavian neighbours? Scotland and the rest of the UK has one of the highest childcare costs in Europe. We spend an average of 26.5% of parental income on them, compared to the OECD average of almost 12%. A recent report by the Family and Child Care Trust suggests that families are paying more than £7,500 per year in childcare costs for two children which amounts to more than the average cost of a mortgage. Under devolution, Scotland has made some progress in improving access to affordable childcare, and I very much welcome that. Since the SNP came to power, we have an increased free nursery provision by 20%. The improvements in flexible early learning and childcare delivered through the Children and Young People Act will benefit over 120,000 children in Scotland and help to save families around £700 per year. This will be welcomed by hard-pressed families across Scotland, though the reality is that only with the powers and resources of independence can we bring about the transformational change needed to help provide the best possible start in life for children in Scotland. Now, Labour MP MSPs assert that this can be done now, can be done now under the limited powers of devolution. If that's the case, then I wonder why these ambitious plans were not brought forward by Labour when they were in power in the previous two administrations, or why they can't tell us now how they would pay for it under the devolution settlement. Professor Sir Donald Mackay, leading economist and former chair of Scottish Enterprise, hit the nail on the head when he said, no financially responsible Scottish government would dare to implement the childcare proposals under the fixed block grant funding of devolution, unless they were prepared to take an ax to existing programmes. Now, I look forward to hearing from the Labour Party about what public services they plan to cut to finance more childcare now under the current limited devolution settlement. As you I have already to close. Outlined, outlined the benefits to the economy that increased access to childcare provides. The Scottish Government has been clear in its commitment to improving access to affordable, high-quality early learning and childcare. 
The Minister for Children and Young People has spoken of her ambition to make Scotland the best place to grow up you must in the world. Close. With the opportunities of independence, we can do just that. Our, our families, our children and our communities deserve nothing less. Thanks. Now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Bob Doris. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, lack of affordable quality childcare is one of the biggest issues um, facing families in Dunfermline and across Scotland. Across the political divide, we all agree that action needs to be taken, and childcare is right, quite rightly rising right to the top of the political agenda. This is welcome news for women across all political parties who have been making the case for childcare for many decades, often falling on deaf ears in parliaments and council chambers that are full of men. I am pleased that childcare is now right at the heart of the mainstream political agenda where it belongs. But for mums and dads, the pace of change is still too slow. We are still waiting for a childcare revolution. And parents deserve better than childcare promises, which are simply uncosted, unworkable, or are taking too long to deliver. Whatever the result in September, we have the powers at Holyrood now to transform childcare in Scotland, and we need to use them, not just talk about them. Our priority must be to ensure that every child, that childcare in Scotland is free and affordable for every parent, and that the childcare challenges don't end when children start school. This must include school children too. In Scotland, we have waited seven long years for the SNP's 2007 childcare pledge to be met. Finally, in August, Scottish parents will catch up with their friends and family in England and Wales. An overdue but welcome step forward. We will also see preschool provision extended to workless families of two-year-olds, a policy which is welcome but also comes with challenges, because local authorities are telling us that the new childcare pledge is not fully funded. And given how important this is in addressing the cycle of disadvantage, this is surely a big concern. Fife Council, for example, has identified a funding gap of £500,000, and this figure does not even factor in the adaptions that need to be made to preschools to cater for two-year-olds. I know, too, from speaking to early years workers in my constituency that there are real concerns about a reduction in the quality of early years education for our two-, three- and four-year-olds as a result of the 600 hours, uh, with less time available for, for planning and setting up the nursery area, less opportunity to discuss the needs and development of individual children, and a real concern about the quality of early learning. Um, uh, so I think it is crucial for the Scottish Government and local authorities to provide the right funding and support to ensure that all our preschool children continue to receive high quality childcare, um, child especially given the fact that curriculum for excellence starts from age three. Given the evidence from the OECD that low quality childcare can damage children's outcomes, we need to monitor this carefully, especially in our more deprived communities where high quality childcare can make a huge difference to children's lives. But delivering 600 hours isn't exactly the childcare revolution mums and dads are waiting for. It's not enough to transform lives. Parents in the rest of the UK have had this level of free childcare since 2010. With parents across Scotland spending a huge proportion of their hard-earned incomes on childcare, urgent action is needed now to ensure that every family can overcome the childcare challenges they face. Childcare costs continue to rise much faster than inflation and certainly much, much faster than wages. And many families spend more on childcare than on their rent, their mortgage and their fuel, or their fuel bills combined. These are costs that are continuing to spiral. And as a couple of colleagues have pointed out, a nursery place costs 30 per cent higher now than it did in 2010. Working full-time is simply not an option for most mums of young children. Indeed, only 24 per cent of mums of three and four-year-olds work full-time. The cost of a full-time childcare place for one child alone is £8,000 a year. Is it any wonder so many parents find they simply have to turn down jobs or reduce their hours, forced to abandon career plans due to sky-high childcare costs? A Save the Children report has found that 80% of the poorest families say that cost is the main barrier in accessing childcare and getting back into work. Some families are just locked out of the labour market entirely, and many families only manage by constant juggling, working different hours to cover childcare, relying on friends, grandparents, even next-door neighbours. While elsewhere in Europe, men are more likely to reduce their hours to share childcare uh, responsibilities. In Scotland, it may be 2014, many, many employers still view childcare as a mum's responsibility and fail to consider the growing needs of working dads who also want to balance work and family life. So in this context, the Scottish Government's pledge to transform childcare after a yes vote does seem attractive, if only there was any evidence at all that it could be delivered. The reality is the SNP's sums simply don't add up. This is a pledge based on Scotland having 40,000 more preschool mums able to return to work than even exist, a pledge that SPICE have estimated will cost at least an additional £1.2 billion to finance, a pledge which isn't 
hasn't been, even been backed up with any financial modelling, despite the policy being one of the key highlights of the White Paper. Parents have waited long enough. They deserve a childcare policy. Uh, sorry. Um, they deserve better than a childcare policy that has, been quest that, has, that has been questioned by the Scottish Parliament's own team of impartial experts. It is time not only for the Scottish Government to publish the full costings of its childcare plans, but it is time for all of us to put aside our political differences and work together to transform childcare for mums, dads, carers, grandparents across Scotland. Our proposal for a childcare commission gives us this opportunity. Parents want real action on childcare. They're fed up being treated as political pawns. And whatever the result of the referendum, we already have the powers at Holyrood to deliver on childcare. Let us use these powers now and work together to deliver a comprehensive childcare strategy. A childcare strategy that Order. doesn't end when children start school. A childcare revolution that will transform the lives of working parents and end the childcare headache that has simply been endured by working parents across Scotland for too long. Now is the time to deliver a childcare system for Scotland that supports all That's our parents close, and gives please. all our children the very best start in life. Many well, thanks. Now, Colin Bob Doris, just under six minutes would be helpful. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, despite some of the rhetoric in here this afternoon, I do absolutely believe that everyone in this chamber wishes to see expanded and flexible early years learning and childcare provision in Scotland. On that front, the Scottish Government has delivered in part, indeed occasionally in partnership, including with uh, Willie Rennie in the chamber this afternoon. But we do have to go much further. I don't have time for intervention, Mr Rennie. Don't get excited. Um, to enable that to happen, any policy developed has to be both affordable and sustainable. That is a truism whether we are independent or not following September's referendum. Turning to the Scottish Government's childcare commitments following a yes vote in the independence referendum, I would of course point to the monies that an independent Scotland would divert from defence spending, including, I am delighted to say, ditching Trident and its replacement, and instead make an overt political choice to pump that money into childcare. I would also point out the specific figures which show a surplus of £8.3 billion in Scotland for comparing money raised and spent in Scotland in the last five years. These two facts are powerful arguments towards the resourcing of childcare within independence. However, that has to be balanced against uh, the next question, and that is, can these commitments be delivered anyway without a yes vote and without independence? Well, in theory, actually, presiding officer, they could be. However, the political choices to be made in order to fund such a revolutionary expansion would not be between Trident and childcare, but rather it would be between our NHS and childcare or our education system and childcare. Perhaps it would be our students and our academics and universities that may be deprioritised after a no vote. Or dare I say something else lurking in the so far undisclosed Labour Party's Cuts Commission. Who knows? We're all in the dark, presiding officer. Those are not the choices that I'm in politics to make, quite frankly. However, as previously stated, I do believe there's genuine commitment across this chamber. It's just that a no vote means a political choice that is to deliver on childcare that, quite frankly, is stark, stark unpalatable and unacceptable. And I want to turn to the tax and revenue implications of the Scottish Government's plan for childcare after independence. And I can say to Mr Rennie again, sorry for name checking you twice and not letting in an intervention, but I can say to Mr Rennie that I'm going to leave the front benches to argue over the details of, and I quote from Mr Rennie's amendment, the component tax revenue streams and the details of that. However, I am going to turn to another truism in relation to this. Put simply, whilst we might argue and debate the extent of the revenue boost through the taxation system, and likewise we may debate the extent of the reduced benefits burden as more people, particularly females, move into work. No one can debate with any degree of credibility that there will not be a financial gain to Scotland by the steps that the Scottish Government will take after independence. No one would have credibility if they were to deny the fact that wealth would flow from that. The question we must ask is this. When the revenues start to flow from childcare policy, as they undoubtedly will, where should those revenues go? Should it go to an independent Scottish exchequer or an out-of-touch, undemocratic, unrepresentative of Scotland Westminster exchequer that will not refund one penny back to Scotland for our good investment and our young people? I think we all know the answer to that. The people of Scotland know that, and that's an independent Scottish exchequer. 
I do actually welcome the motion before us today from Labour, because it does shine a light on two levers of power essential to deliver revolutionary childcare expansion. Firstly, being able to make the political choices on all aspects of spend in Scotland in order to prioritise what we wish to see. So for us in this side of the chamber, it is childcare rather than trident. And secondly, to get the benefits of economic growth and for that money to flow to a Scottish exchequer and not to an out-of-touch London Tory government. Two levers of power we can only have with independence, irrespective of whether the other parties wish to argue over the numbers within uh, the Scottish Government's uh, white paper. The process is quite clear. The, level of, the, the, the levers of power are quite self-evident. We need them in Scotland, and those can only be delivered with independence. So enough of the number crunching. Just accept that we need these powers to deliver on childcare. Now, I want to look a little bit more at the wider picture. Kezia, I'm genuinely disappointed I can't let you in, but I want to move on and speak about something else, because so far no one's spoken about, I don't think, the wider picture about getting people into work in childcare. And we have to look at UK tax credit reforms in relation to that. So if we look at the childcare element of working tax credit and the changes to that, that's made working families in Scotland up to £1,560 worse off. If we look at changes to family tax credit system, that's made uh, many families in Scotland up to £3,870 worse off. And let me give you a story I repeatedly tell in this chamber. Those changes that mean you only get working tax credits if you increase your part-time hours from 16 hours to 24 hours has pushed two families I know in Mary Hill out of work and onto benefits. That's not a progressive system. And the connection between childcare provision and getting families into work and lifelong prospects are, are, are absolutely dovetail. They're intertwined. And that's the wider picture. And all those powers, quite genuinely, for something that I'm passionate in, for Beth, Emily and Hannah, my three little nieces, they have to come to this parliament for a coherent, socially just, place, progressive and visionary childcare system. And, presiding officer, it is only with independence we can achieve that. Thanks so much. And before we move to closing speeches, I'd invite all members who have taken part in the debate to arrive in the chamber as soon as possible. Colin Willie Rennie, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I mean, I, as a, as a Liberal, as a Liberal Democrat, we in the party support the principle of spend to save. We think it's something that should be encouraged for us to look forward to see what we can invest now to make long term changes. That's why. Back in the 90s, we had a, a very strong policy of a penny on income tax for education because we recognised the value of investing in education. We were prepared to make the sacrifice at the time by putting up income tax by one pence in the pound so that we could invest millions of pounds in improving education. That's something that we strongly supported. I think the difference between what we are suggesting or what the SNP are suggesting now, and what we did then, was that we had a transparent, costed process. We had set out in detail what the sacrifice would be, the income tax being raised in order to pay for it. Now, we recognise that there would be returns to the Exchequer at a later date, but our approach was a cautious approach. We recognise that it might not all come back to the Exchequer. It might not have those optimistic, desired Effects. So, therefore, we took a cautious approach, which is the approach that Treasuries take across the world. They don't assume that it will be the golden opportunity that comes and will definitely come. They recognise that it might fall a little bit short of that. They've still got ambition. They've still got desire to make that change, but they are cautious with it. And it is the particular problem that we have with this, and this is where Alison, not just now, this is where Alison Johnson uh, was right. Um, whereas we need to scrutinise proposals. We do. It doesn't mean we don't have ambition. I mean, I was disappointed with Joan McAlpine's contribution because she was criticising the Labour benches for lacking ambition. You don't lack ambition if you question. You've got to have the right to be able to quiz, to question, to scrutinise. That's what this Parliament is about. And the reason why it's particularly important on this occasion is because if people vote for independence, I'll come to Jimmy Hepburn in a second. If we vote for independence on the basis, not just now, on the basis of more childcare, and they are wrong, 
and it does not deliver the benefits they say that it will bring to the Exchequer, then there is no way back. We cannot reverse the decision. We cannot decide to reverse independence. That is the difference between this spend and save proposal. Now, they shout doom and gloom. They cannot accuse me of lacking ambition on nursery education. Members Bob not taking Doris intervention. And I were, you know, the, the loving continues, Bob Doris. But, but Bob and I recognised <laughs> together that we had done we had done a lot on nursery education. We had pushed it when many others were sceptical in this chamber. We had pushed that. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's right for people to criticise Bob and myself for lacking that uh, kind of ambition. Can we use we full had, names? Absolutely. It's the, lo it's the love in, presiding officer. <laughs> Bob Doris and I refer to each other by our first names. Um, but it's, just because we question does not mean we lack ambition. And it's disappointing for some uh, to do so. Christine Graham talked about blaming Westminster for the lack of funds. Can I just gently remind her that in England, they are delivering for 40% of two-year-olds, 40% of two-year-olds, which is far more than has been delivered in Scotland on the same budget. Yes, I'll take another question. Christine Graham. Figures on the continuing debt of the UK and the continuing payments, and it's now at 1.2 trillion. Do you dispute that? Well, Irene. She seems to be implying that Scotland would be debt free. I mean, the reality is that Scotland would have an equally challenging financial circumstances. It is no different. It will be the same. The reality is that she blames Westminster, but in reality, they are doing far, far more um, in terms of delivering nursery education. But at the heart of all this is our desire to make a transformational change for childcare. We do all agree in this chamber, despite misquoting on various occasions. Stuart Maxwell talked about it very passionately, I thought. Um, Jane Baxter, Ken McIntosh, Alison Johnson, all talking about the different strands of benefit that nursery education brings. Getting people back to work, getting mothers back to work, clearly a distinct benefit. It's got to be affordable. We've got to have a childcare that is affordable so that they can get back to work and it makes work pay. Child development, which um, Mary Scanlon talked about. It is about child development as much as education, but also education. And as a Liberal, I strongly believe that education is the route out of poverty. This particular education at this early stage makes a significant benefit. Professor James Heckman, my favourite academic, who talks about investing before the age of three to make that transformational uh, change. So we all agree that this is the way to progress. It's how we do it. You have and 30 I think seconds. it's not unreasonable to question the SNP's sums. And it's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable for them to be forthcoming with a little bit more detail. This is not just a normal manifesto proposal. This is a referendum proposal from which we have no way back if they are wrong. And that's why it's important that we do have the detail so we can scrutinise, so people can go to the polls in September with full understanding of what the policy means. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I now call Ms Smith. Ms Smith, six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the uh, very heated exchanges in some aspects of this debate, I don't think there is any chance whatsoever uh, that childcare, or I thought uh, Alison Johnson made a very good point about perhaps we should be talking about care of children, uh, will be moving out of the political limelight. And therefore, uh, the first commitment that is part of the uh, Labour Party's uh, motion is absolutely guaranteed, and that is a good thing. But I hope that this is the case not because of the arguments about the referendum, but because of the crucial importance of the care of children to the dynamic of social and economic policy in this country. Excellent points that were made by Malcolm Chisholm, by Jane Baxter, Ken McIntosh and Jamie Hepburn, who I thought talked uh, very well about the principle. Because together with the uh, provision of nursery education, it is not just the centrepiece of the early years strategy, but also of education policy more generally, and of course of the demographic influences on employment. And as such, there is absolutely no surprise that all parties in this chamber are on record calling for childcare provision to be broadened, for greater foca focus to be laid 
on its qualitative features, something which I think everybody in this chamber is agreed is just as important about the number of hours that we can actually deliver. And while it's perhaps uh, tempting to uh, take Freud's dictum about the narcissism of small differences when it comes to childcare, there are, as the Labour Party has pointed out, substantive points to be made, not about the general principles of the policy direction, but what has actually been set out within the SNP's white paper in terms of timescales and in terms of funding commitments. And can I say at this point that nobody doubts the scale of the finances that are required to deliver what we would all like to see, or indeed the challenge that Claire Adamson referred to when she talked about the white, wider context uh, of what we have to do in terms of policy making. Nobody doubts that. But as my colleague Mary Scanlon rightly argued earlier, the Scottish Government's figures, especially in relation to boosting female uh, involvement in the labour market, do not stand up. And that's largely because there isn't sufficient evidence that the childcare policy under discussion will, not might, will actually lead to the 6% rise in female employment as outlined in the government's various statistical bulletins. We've seen several of these bulletins. The dispute here is not about different political parties arguing on different figures. The fact of the matter, is, in, in a minute if I may, the fact is of, of, of this debate is that we do not have a policy model against which to make the judgments about this policy. I give way. Joe McCamp. I thank the member for taking the intervention. She, she talked about um, the evidence. Um, she'll be aware that both the OECD and the European Commission have presented evidence that increasing childcare and making it more affordable does increase the number of women in the workforce. Is she suggesting that that's wrong? Well, Smith. I'm not disputing that in any way. What I'm disputing are the specific figures that have been put forward as the guarantee, and that is a guarantee, that it will deliver the 6% rise in female employment. That's the problem. And that is something from which I think the SNP will find it very difficult to argue otherwise. And so I think Willie Rennie, in his very eloquent speeches, is absolutely right when he says in his amendment that it makes plain that the problem is a fundamental concern at the root of the current policy. And can I pay tribute to Willie Rennie and to Malcolm Chisholm for their commitment over a long period of time in making very positive contributions to the debate. And he is quite right to say that it is not a problem to question. The whole point of a parliament is to scrutinise. Yes, exactly. And that is again part of the frustration which Kezia Dugdale uh, rightly uh, put out in her uh, opening remarks. There is a problem about the lack of scrutiny in that. And that is something that I think uh, Tom uh, Gordon had when he was looking at this, uh, when uh, he was responding uh, to some FOI requests. That is the great difficulty that we have. It's not about the different views that we might hold. It's about the problem of the lack of scrutiny. Now, presiding officer, I think there are three essential aspects of policy development on childcare. It's availability, it's quality, and its affordability. The Minister has said that there is good progress on the first two, and there is. And let's rejoice in that fact. Let's admit that. And I don't really think that it's uh, in any dispute around the Chamber. But there are questions about its affordability, as Alison Johnson has rightly uh, said, because different local authorities take a different approach. Uh, there are wide variations across our local authorities. Uh, but that is something that I think we can probably get round. If we are to move forward, and this is nothing whatsoever to do with the referendum, if we are to move forward in the way that we want to do as a parliament, we have to accept that we must put forward credible and costed policy. That is the judgment against which we all will be asked by the voters to decide what we want to do in our manifestos. Another and it is, on that it is on that basis, presiding officer, that we will support the Labour motion and indeed the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie. I now call on Michael Russell, Cabinet Secretary, eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, um, I want to start at the outset by agreeing both with Liz Smith and with Kezia Dugdale, because uh, it is true that the first sentence of the <coughs> motion will be retained by the amendment in Aideen Campbell's name. And it is true that it is the thing that unites us, as Liz Smith has said, the Parliament does resolve, it will resolve, I'm sure it will go on resolving, to keep childcare at the top of the political agenda 
regardless of the referendum result. Because childcare should unite, not divide this chamber. And it is a, a measure, I'm sorry to say, of Labour's failure in Scotland, not just in losing yet another election this week, but in seeking to divide yet again on something that should work for all of us. Because we do all agree on the need for transformational childcare. But if you can believe it can be achieved without the full fiscal powers of independence, you need to come to this chamber with ideas about how that can be done. And instead, regrettably, in the first 14 minutes that we had, we simply had an attack on others. It was in its entirety, if I say so, I say so charitably, a litany of negative gurning. No proposals, nothing new, not even a timescale, just negativity. Now, Claire Adamson asked a very germane question at the very beginning. She said, does Labour mean it? Well, I think they probably do, to be fair. I think what we've heard today from Labour is a failure of politics rather than policy, even if that policy is, as Spice has pointed out, out of date and threadbare. And the parallel, if I can say it quite genuinely, this chamber is this. It's 2003. In 2003, uh, I was a member of an opposition in this chamber that thought that the Labour administration was evil, deceitful, idle, all sorts of other things. It just, we just needed, as an opposition, to tear away the mask. We demonised our opponents, and we lost that election. Negative is always beaten in politics by positive. That's an important lesson. And the longer, and we hear that, we hear that there, the longer that Labour fails to realise it is the longer they will go on losing elections just like they did last weekend. Because character assassination is not a policy. Hatred is not a policy. Resentment is not a policy. Pious hand-wringing is not a policy. Action is a policy. And there's action aplenty from this government. Willie Reddy commended to us the importance of fact, presiding officer. That's a, a little rich in a day where Professor Dunleavy has questioned the Lib Dem approach to facts. <laughs> but facts show that transformational childcare can't be delivered under devolution as it exists. That's a fact. Now, Mary Scanlon attacked me for uh, my remarks on deconstruction, but I repeat them. We, the, the, the Tory approach, the approach in this chamber is often, we want this policy, but we don't want the SNP to have the credit for it. So, no, I want to, I want to make a lot of progress on this because it's important. So we'll attack government for not publishing enough, then we'll attack the government for resenting scrutiny, and when figures are produced, we'll dismiss them without even considering them. What we won't do, what the opposition won't do, is publish their own plans. What the opposition won't do is dare face the fact, they won't dare face the fact that there are limits to devolution. There are some things that can only be delivered by independence. So they will deconstruct, they will undermine, they will destroy because they know what they want. No, I want to finish this because they know that what they want can't be achieved by devolution. And that's why the opposition is so scared. Because when the penny drops, it will be absolutely clear that the only way to achieve transformative childcare is through independence. Mr. Smith, well, to the Cabinet Secretary. I do take issue with him uh, when it comes to uh, costed uh, interventions. The Scottish Conservative Party for the last two manifestos has given a full commitment on its costings. You might not agree with these policy objectives, but we have given the costings, and I would uh, appreciate if you could recognise that. Well, I recognise it, but nobody believed them. I mean, you were elected because nobody believed those costings. No, and let me quote Donald Mackay, giving evidence to the Economic, Energy and Tourism Committee last month. This is the reality of this policy. No financially responsible Scottish Government would dare to implement the childcare proposals under the fixed block grant funding of devolution unless unless they were prepared to take an axe to existing programmes. Now, that's the truth. This cannot be done under devolution. And what we've heard this afternoon is a measure of frustration. No, I don't want, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to take these points because the frustration will show again. Mr Bibby's frustration that he knows this can't be delivered unless you have the powers of independence. Now, Ken McIntosh talked about the sincere Members commitment of the Liberal and Labour administration, and it was a sincere commitment. And it is coming now to the limit of what can be achieved under devolution. And the truth is that the truth of that lies in the remarks of Lucy Powell, 
Labour Shadow Minister for Children talking about this policy, these policies. Enabling women to go back to work who want to go back to work will increase revenues to the Exchequer significantly such that over time it pays for itself. If we don't have the fiscal powers, we don't have the Exchequer, we can't make it pay for itself. That is the truth of devolution. So I'm afraid, I'm afraid that is that is the truth. And then when you can't face the truth, then you twist the words. Because the spice briefing does not say purely what Labour says. Certainly there's a paragraph that starts off with that, but then it goes on. The very next sentence, the sentence that Labour has not actually quoted, seems to be funny. Perhaps they haven't read it. Maybe the only bit they were given was a bit that stood up to Kezia Dugdale's argument. It says, in order to achieve the model scenarios, the policy would need to influence the labour market decisions of a larger group of women, which could include women who do not currently have children, who have children under age one or over five, future groups of women, either before or when they have children, which could extend the timescale of the impact. In other words, SPICE recognises that the policy operates over more than one year, and women who re-enter the labour market as a result of free childcare stay in the labour market even when their children get older. Without the help we propose, too many would never do so. Now I want to bring to an end my remarks with uh, some thoughts on a very wise contribution to this debate. It came from Joan McAlpine. She was quite right to draw attention to the contrast between the passionate ambition of what you might call transformative labour and the managerialism of the current Labour Party. Faced with what Jackie Brock in Children in Scotland called a game changer, extremely exciting, they retreated into the Bain principle. If it's coming from the Nats, we don't support it, not now, not ever. John McAlpine, presiding officer, said that Labour today had no route map. Absolutely true. There's no satnav, no gazetteer, no atlas, no compass, nothing to guide them at all. Their very principles have been lost in a fog of resentment about their electoral failure at the hands of the SNP. And in what you might call, to use a, to use a local analogy, this horror of anxiety about the positive message of independence, that's the vehicle that's going to transform childcare and transform so much else. There are limits to devolution. We've reached those limits. The time is to go forward with this and independence. I now call on Neil Bibby to wind up the bay. Uh, Mr Bibby to 529, please. Thank you, President Officer. Labour brought forward this debate today because we are committed to supporting families with childcare and we want to see real action. And there have been a number of good contributions uh, on how that can be achieved. Malcolm Chisholm, Alison Johnston and Liz Smith made very good speeches and I think Willie Rennie and Jamie Hepburn made very important points as well. As Kezia Dugdale said in opening, this debate is because we recognise the need to develop a long-term strategy, a strategy that improves and increases preschool provision and expands wraparound care for primary school pupils too, and a strategy that reaches a consensus across party lines, which is why we have repeated our call from a year ago to tackle the issue on a cross-party basis in the form of a Scottish Child Care Commission. As our motion says, we should all share a determination to put childcare at the top of the political agenda, no matter the referendum result. Childcare is not a constitutional issue. Childcare is an important social and economic policy. But it is not a reason to break away from the UK, particularly when powers over childcare have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament since 1999 and under the responsibility of SNP ministers for the past seven years. But unfortunately, the nationalists have sought to make it a constitutional issue when they launched the white paper in November. If the nationalists want to make childcare a constitutional issue, then they need to offer the substance and evidence rather than wishful thinking. The SPICE briefing, early learning and childcare, blew apart the SNP's childcare claims, and if today we have heard the same old, same old arguments with no new evidence when they had the opportunity from the Scottish Government. And I want to deal with some of the claims that nationalists have made today and in the White Paper. I want to make some progress. The first one we heard from the Minister, George Adam, Stuart Maxwell. We need the powers of independence to improve childcare. Well, that's not true, because you already have the powers. You just haven't used them until very recently. We've also heard the Minister say that the SNP's ambition is transformational. 
childcare? Well, if the SNP have always been so ambitious about childcare, why is childcare provision lagging behind the rest of the UK right now? In August this year, 40% of two-year-olds in England will get nursery, but only 15% in Scotland. Some ambition. But perhaps the biggest claim that has been made by the SNP that has been completely discredited by SPICE is the reason we need independence for childcare is that it will be completely self-funding. I have no doubt more childcare can help more women enter the job market if childcare the meets away. their needs. There are jobs available, they have the skills they need and crucially it suits their circumstances to go back to work. The SNP have said an increase in female employment of 104,000 would fund the policy. The problem they have, the very big problem they have with that claim, is that SPICE found that in 2011 there were only 64,000 women with nursery-aged children who were, as it describes, economically inactive, and out of them only 14,000 wanted to work. Now, we know the SNP want to suspend the rules of arithmetic in this referendum debate, but 14,000 and 104,000 don't go. But the new claim for SNP ministers uh, and, and members today is ignore space. There are more than enough women. We've heard the SNP make up lots of things ahead of this referendum, but the one thing you cannot make up is human beings that don't exist. There are at least anywhere between 40,000 and 90,000 missing Mr. mums Adam. for this policy to be self-funding. Enough mums to fill Hamden Park or even Wembley Stadium. And now without any evidence to back it up, we hear the claim from the SNP, it won't happen straight away. This will happen over time. Really? Well, how long? How long will it take to your policy to be credible? Ten years? 20 years, 30 years. Christine Graham said there would be cuts to childcare if we vote no. Talk about scaremongering from the SNP. <laughs> I'd be interested to know, is that the official SNP line? Are they really going to say that there will be no increase in childcare if we vote no in the referendum in September? I noticed they're not making any comment on that. Obviously not the official SNP line. Mr Bibby, minute. Ms Graham, I wasn't calling you. I was reprimanding you for shouting across the chamber. Mr Bibby. Uh, Mike Russell and Joe McAlpine also said we lacked the ambition of Naya Bevan. I would just say to Joe McAlpine, she is no Naya Bevan. I would say to Mike Russell, he's no Naya Bevan either. <laughs> Today was the opportunity for the SNP government to come to the chamber and dispute the evidence from SPICE that their policy is unfunded and uncosted. The only new thing we heard today was from Bob Doris, who said that Trident is going to pay for childcare. I thought the policy was self-funding, Bob Doris. <laughs> Presiding officer. Minister. That's the things the SNP have told us, but what haven't they told us? In terms of costings, I've asked the Minister for Children and Young People for a total cost of the policy before today, since the White Paper was published again today, and has consistently refused to answer that question. How incompetent is this government when they can't even tell us the total cost of their flagship policy? Perhaps it's not surprising when John Swinney can't or won't tell us 100 days before the referendum what the set-up cost of independence would be. In I'm happy, I'm happy to take Order. an intervention. I'm happy to take Order. an intervention if any of the members want to tell me what the setup of independence will be. No, no takers. No takers. Order. No takers. We know in terms Order. of childcare. Can we just settle down, please? We know in terms of childcare, Spice have given us an answer. They have estimated it will cost in the region of 1.2 billion and could be even higher at 1.5 billion. What else have they not told us about the Spice facts and findings? 
that the modelling that has been published isn't even directly related to the SNP childcare policy because it does not consider whether that policy would cause an increase of 6% in female labour market participation. So there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest the white paper childcare commitment would result in Scotland's female participation rate matching that of Sweden. The SNP have also based their figures on all women working full-time when we know that women want to work part-time. The SNP don't base any calculations on the average female wage of 17,000, but on the 26,000 annual figure for men and women. They don't tell us that in 2013, women's gross average hourly pay was 17% lower compared to men. And there are many other issues, including the potential downward pressure on real wages identified by SPICE. So there we have it, the SNP's white paper childcare policies. Never have seen such a demolishment of a misleading <laughs> policy claims that the SPICE briefing in April. Order. Low full costings, Order. low Let's self funding. The when there have Order. been calculations based on the ROG figures, all to be paid for without an increase in tax at the same time as cutting corporation tax yeah. and also to be paid for without cutting other public services by £1.2 billion. However, the most revealing aspect of how little substance the SNP's childcare policy has is the lens they are going to hide the figures behind the policy. The journalist Tom Gordon under Freedom of Information sought to find out if ministers had modelled their actual childcare policies. He was told no. Then the Scottish Government quickly retracts that and says yes. But guess what? The Scottish Government says it's not in the public interest to publish it. How can hiding the truth be in the public interest? We've asked for this modelling to be published in written questions and oral questions and again here in this debate today. It's not in the public interest to publish it. It's not in the SNP's interest to publish the full economic modelling and costing. Why else would ministers go to such lengths to keep it hidden? I'll ask one more time. Will the Scottish Government publish all the economic modelling or costings, yes or no? Well, since they didn't say yes, presiding officer, since they didn't say yes, and they've not disputed the spice claims, we need to get back to using the powers that we have in this parliament. We need to form a cross-party childcare commission to look at the issues identify the problems and fund the childcare that our families desperately need. It is regrettable that yet again the SNP choose to put the constitution before childcare. Thank you. That concludes this debate on Scotland Future. I have a point of order, Alice McInnes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. On a point of order, I refer to Standing Order 7.3.1. During the statement on the sleeper franchise, I referred to the proposal to abolish the sleeper service north of Edinburgh. In response, the Transport Minister said, and I quote, Alison McInnes is just making it up when she says we propose to abolish this. She's just making this kind of stuff up, and she's completely wrong. However, any member can go to the Scottish Government's website and follow the link to Transport Scotland, where the real 2014 paper states at paragraph 11.12, and I quote, we are considering a number of options for, for the future provision of sleeper services, for instance, removing or increasing financial support, semicolon, and reducing the provision, either through removing the Highland or Lowland service or by running the Lowland services to and from Edinburgh only. Given that we have an out-of-touch transport Order. minister who doesn't know what his own agency was suggesting, will there be an opportunity for the Minister to come back to the Chamber, Presiding Officer, after he has done some basic research and admit that the sleeper service was under a threat and the only outrage from the people in the north-east of Scotland and the Highlands changed that? Can I thank the Member for the advance notice of her point of order? As the Member is well aware, the Presiding Officer is not responsible for the veracity of the comments Members make in the Chamber. The next item of business is consideration motion number 10134 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10134. Minister. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 101, sorry, 10134 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of four 
business motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions number 10135 to 10138, setting out stage one and stage two timetables for various bills and block. Moved on block. I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 10135 to 10138. If many, any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motions numbers 10135 to 10138, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a Parliamentary Bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10139 on approval of an SSI on single-use carrier bags charge Scotland regulations. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10139. Formally moved. Alec Ferguson has indicated that he wishes to speak against the motion. I now call Alec Ferguson. You have up till three minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Having opposed this instrument when it came before the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee last week, I think it's only right that I explain to the Chamber why I took that action. I very much share the Government's desire to reduce litter and indeed to reduce the use of single-use carrier bags, as do my colleagues, but I simply do not accept that this piece of legislation will bring about those laudable aims. We have been assured that the legislation is evidence-based, but I have asked myself several times on what evidence it is based, because much of that evidence seems to me to be conflicting. In Ireland, it was claimed that the use of plastic carrier bags fell markedly, indeed up to 90 per cent, following the introduction of similar legislation, and yet the demand for plastic film rose by over 30 per cent to some 29,000 tonnes as consumers turned to different types of carrier bags, different types of plastic carriers for their convenience. In Wales, the use of paper bags also fell dramatically following its legislation, but paper bag usage is now back to the same level as it was before the Welsh legislation was introduced. So those evidence bases have apparently been ignored largely by the Scottish Government. But my main concern lies in the field of food safety, and I believe the government is wrong to include carrier bags for the fast food and food-to-go sectors within this legislation. There is evidence that the single paper biodegradable bag in which you receive and transport your carry-out meal can actually help to reduce litter by acting as a receptacle for all the various individual items of packaging that such a meal requires. These bags will not, and indeed should not, be reused, and there are some very valid concerns being aired which show that the reuse of any bags for edible food purposes, especially hot food, carries very real health risks with it. And if that's not enough, I hope those members uh, who represent Kirkcaldy are aware that Smith Anderson of Kirkcaldy, major suppliers of paper bags to both Burger King and McDonald's, estimate that this legislation would cost as many as 40 jobs out of their workforce. So I don't believe this measure will reduce litter. I don't believe it will reduce the overall demand for plastic. I think there is a very real risk of reduced food safety by the inclusion of the food-to-go sector within the legislation. And I, for one, do not wish to see 40 jobs disappearing in Kirkcaldy as a result of this legislation. I said in committee, presiding off, that I hope I'm... I will absolutely close by saying I hope I'm wrong about this, but the evidence that I've seen suggests I won't be. I now call on Richard Lockhead to respond, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to respond to the Conservatives' objection to what I believe will be one of Parliament's most progressive environmental policies. I am disappointed by Alec Ferguson's stance, but not surprised that the Conservatives have chosen to try and block what is a very good environmental measure. As I told the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee last Wednesday, Scotland uses around 750 million single-use carrier bags a year, each and every year, from supermarkets alone, more per head than anywhere else on these islands. And the committee agreed with me, by a margin of 8 to 1, that it is time to take action to reduce the number of these bags given out. So this is part of our wider work to tackle Scotland's litter problem. Carrier bags are a highly visible and damaging part of the litter problem in our communities, by our roadsides and, of course, particularly in our seas. This is also about challenging the throwaway society by placing a value on bags. We want to promote reuse of bags and, of course, other items in our society to help get the most out of our increasingly limited resources and cut carbon emissions at the same time. So these regulations are designed to offer a proportionate response to this issue. We have been careful to ensure that the administration will be as light touch as possible, particularly for small businesses. 
It is a requirement to charge, not a tax. Shoppers can, of course, avoid it by bringing their own bags to the shops. It is clear that there is support for this measure from many retailers, from their customers and from environmental organisations as well. Indeed, last year's consultation saw a strong response in favour of the charge and we have had constructive dialogue with all stakeholders during the process. And I certainly believe the public support this measure. Indeed, Keep Scotland Beautiful's opinion poll just last week indicates strong public support with almost two to one of those questioned in favour of the charge. Similar charges to what we are proposing are working well in Wales and Northern Ireland. Indeed, even the UK Government is set to introduce a charge in England. The Scottish Government's proposals are coherent and thorough. Mr Ferguson and his colleagues would have us make our proposals less coherent and less thorough, rather like what the UK Government indeed is doing. Indeed, DEFRA's proposals to exempt paper and biodegradable bags have been roundly criticised by the Westminster Environment Audit Committee in comparison, of course, with the Welsh scheme, which is in line with their own proposals. That committee said exemptions for small retailers and paper and biodegradable bags make it confusing for consumers, potentially harmful for the recycling industry and less effective than the Welsh scheme, where bag use has been reduced by over 75 per cent, with a straightforward five pence charge on all disposable carrier bags. Therefore, it is clearly time for Scotland to take action on this issue, and I urge members to back these regulations. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of a further parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10140 on the suspension of standing orders. Moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10131.3 in the name of Aileen Campbell, which seeks to amend motion number 10131 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on Scotland's future. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10131.3 in the name of Aileen Campbell is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 48. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10131.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend motion number 10131 in the name of Kezia Dugley on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10131.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, 48. No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10131 in the name of Kezia Dugdale as amended on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10131 in the name of Kezia Dugdale as amended is as follows. 
yes 64, no 48, there were no abstentions, so therefore the motion as amended is agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10139 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI on single-use carrier bags be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote of motion number 10139 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 100. No, 12. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10140 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on suspension of standing orders be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber. Should do so quickly and quietly.